All right, I'll just start some sort of general announcements and that way we can get started um, with our first speaker at about 9.35. And I hope you all can hear me and see me. And if you can't, feel free to put something in the chat. I will say, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and that way we can answer them even if we need to move on to the next speaker. Um, we find that works best. So if do not put your questions in the chat as far as questions for speakers. If you have a question like that's sort of administrative, like if you're having trouble or you need to get back in or anyway, you need some other kind of help from either Caroline or myself, feel free to put that in the chat. But if you have a, a question on one of the subjects that's being covered um, with one of the speakers, please put that in the Q and A and that way they can answer it. Um, first of all, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. I wanna thank uh, Caroline Furman for helping with the logistics, Zoom webinar, confirmations, things like that. I wanna thank Anita Oberholster for all of her advice um, on putting these things together. I wanna thank uh, Carl Lund. I worked very closely with Carl um, to choose relevant topics and speakers for uh, folks in this area. And actually Carl, has a couple of announcements, so feel free to chime in. Hello, everybody, and thank you for showing up today. Uh, so a couple things. Um, during this, uh, our, we have finally moved offices. So I know we've been talking about moving offices since before I even got hired with UCANR. So the new UCCE Madeira office has now moved to 145 Tozer Street. Uh, we are suite 103. Now it's the same situation as before when we were on Madera Avenue, we are splitting the building with the Ag Commissioner. So if you've gone to the Ag Commissioner's new office, we're still in the same one. Unfortunately though, if you just put in 145 Tozer Street into your GPS device, it's not going to take you to the correct place. Uh, so where we actually are is we're on Road 28. Road 28 is being renamed Tozer Street, but it hasn't like fully made it into the Google system that that's happening. Um, and so we're on road 28, just north. We're the second building north of Avenue 14 and Olive Avenue. So if you go to Olive Avenue and road 28 and go north a little bit, uh, we're right there. So if you need, a, need to find the new building or the new Ag Commissioner building, that is where we are. Um, that is also the old Sheriff's substation. So we've taken over the Sheriff's old substation there, which is also where the juvenile hall is. So. If you know where the juvenile hall is from either your wild younger days or your children's wild younger days, <laughs> uh, we're, we're right there in front of that building. Uh, so we're right in that area. Um, the other item that I wanted to mention is that uh, the Vit Tips newsletter, we're gonna be sending out a survey on what topics you guys would like us to cover. So if you guys could fill that out, um, it's a good way of, of telling us which topics you want to hear from us so that we can cover things that are interesting to you, not just things that, you know, me, George, and Gabriel want to talk about. So it make, it, it's helpful if you guys can fill that out so that we can get topics on subjects you guys want to hear. All right. Thank you guys for attending and I'll mute and pass it back over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Carl. And thank you again for um, help with choosing relevant topics for this area. I'd also like to thank all the speakers for their willingness to participate and taking the time to be here today. And so without further ado, I think we'll actually get started. Our first speaker today is Kendra Baumgartner. She's a research plant pathologist with the USDA Agricultural Research Service and a department. She's also in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis. And she's gonna be speaking today. Her title is When Trunk Diseases Spread and How to Prevent Infection. Thank you so much, Karen, for the invitation. Um, and then let me just get my presentation started up. Bear with me. <laughs> and we can see it. Yep. Does that look good? Yep. All right, thanks so much. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to these diseases and talk a little bit about how they spread and then also um, list some of the different treatments that we've tested to prevent infection. 
First, I want to mention that, you know, and you may be familiar with some of these diseases based on the wood symptoms they cause. Um, some of the diseases cause wood cankers, others form black spots in the wood, others cause a wood rot or a wood decay. And all of those discolored sections of the wood are dead. They're not functional once you see them looking like that. Um, these infections tend to be localized near where the pathogens enter the vine in the first place, which is typically a wound. Um, they're not systemic throughout the entire vine. It's not like the fungus gets in through one wound and then spreads its way throughout the entire vine. Um, so that's good in a way. Um, the fungi who ca that cause trunk diseases will tend to live in an area kind of nearby the, the discolored wood, wood that looks healthy, but is clearly infected. And at some point, these fungi will make their way out to the surface of the vine, to the bark where they produce their spores. Um, the best strategy for managing trunk diseases is to do everything you can to prevent them from getting in in the first place because these are chronic infections. Three of the trunk diseases are called dieback type trunk diseases. And they're, they're distinct diseases, Botryosphera dieback, Fomopsis dieback, and Eutypha dieback. Um, although they're caused by different pathogens, um, one thing they all share in common is that they kill fruiting positions. And this obviously causes yield losses in the vineyard over time. Um, because shoots are dying, the vine tends to have lower photosynthetic capacity. So it'll just decline in capacity over time in general gradually over the course of many years. The first symptoms of these dieback type diseases that tend to appear in the vineyard um, may be between years six and eight. You may see your first symptomatic vines. That said, those infections have happened beforehand. Um, the dieback type trunk diseases and ESCA, all the trunk diseases, um, share in common the fact that there's a long delay between when the infection happens and when the first symptoms become noticeable. It can be months, it can be years, depending on the pathogen and how susceptible the cultivar is. Um, generally speaking, between years 10 and 15 is when there's a, great, a very dramatic increase of the number of symptomatic vines in the vineyard. Um, it can be as little as 20% of the vines in year 10. It can be as many as 75% of the vines in year 15. Um, although many vines start to show symptoms during this time in maturity, in the vineyard's maturity, um, they're not necessarily becoming infected during this time. Um, they're becoming infected years before that. It's just taken this long for them to really start showing symptoms. ESCA is a little bit different than the dieback type trunk diseases. Um, it doesn't tend to kill spurs. It tends to impact fruit development. Um, and for wine grapes, um, especially the red wine grapes, some studies overseas have shown that um, with uh, poor fruit maturity, you get poor wine, uh, poor phenolic development in red wines. ESCA symptoms can be extremely variable. So in some vineyards, you can see a gradual decline in vine capacity over the course of many years. In others, there may be no noticeable impacts on vigor. Um, pictured in this slide is a Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard that used to be in Lodi, it's since been replanted. Um, but those vines were incredibly vigorous um, with some symptomatic shoots and some perfectly healthy looking shoots on them. The symptoms, um, which I'll show you in detail in a moment, they can start to appear sometimes as early as year four or year six. Um, but although, like I said about the dieback type trunk diseases, those infections that lead to those symptoms happen years beforehand. And I'll go through the symptoms of the different trunk diseases now and when it's best to look for them for those of you who aren't familiar with them. Botryosphera dieback is best um, seen between bud break and bloom. Um, and the, the most widespread symptom caused by this disease is a dead spur. Um, also you see stunted shoots and the leaves on those stunted shoots won't look noticeably different. You know, they might be a little bit yellowed, a little bit dwarfed, um, but it'll look 
green. They don't have any distinct leaf symptoms is what I'm trying to say. Eutypa dieback is a little bit different from Botryosphera dieback in that um, it does have very distinct leaf symptoms. Um, where the fungus lives inside the wood, it produces a toxin and those toxins get carried out to the shoots and they can cause the shoots to be deformed. Sometimes they have a cupped appearance. Um, other times they'll look like instead of growing kind of fan shaped, they'll all grow in parallel. Um, and it's thought that the toxins disrupt the normal hormone production of the plant such that you know, the auxins and the cytokinins, the things that are important um, in hormone production for leaf size and shape and all of those things are, are out of sorts. Also, you can get these brown spots um, and edges of the leaves. Of the leaves. Um, you type a dieback, um, can kill spurs though. Um, so, you know, my, my advice to you is to look for those dead spurs before you start trying to hunt for these very distinct leaf symptoms. Fomopsis dieback is a very widespread dieback type trunk disease. Um, I'm showing you the same picture I showed you for Botryosphera dieback because the vine had both, both Botryosphera and Fomopsis dieback's. Um, these are our two most widespread and common trunk diseases in California. It's not uncommon to find both of them in the same vineyard and also in the same vine. Fomopsis dieback kills spurs, it can stunt shoots, and it can also cause, um, although it's, it's not as common to see, it can cause, a, a, I think George Levitt calls it a shoot blight. Um, the fungus can attack every green tissue of the vine. Um, we might see it in wet springs where you get the spores produced after bud break and then those spores can splash onto and attack um, green tissues. Um, the stems seem to be a little more susceptible than the leaves and you'll see these brown black spots um, typically at the base of the trunk. Another symptom of Fomopsis blight or um, it's technically called Fomopsis cane and leaf spot is these bleached canes where they look very white um, and sometimes you'll see some black spots on them too. And this cane here, this whole tip of it is dead. Um, this bud is just kind of starting to push out and you know my, my guess would be that that would push out as a very stunted bud. The dieback type trunk diseases um, you know, those shoots that come out, if they grow out at all from infected spurs, often die within that growing season or future growing seasons. And if you cut through those spurs or the cordon or lower down on the vine, you will find a wood canker. And this, the shape of that wood canker, the color, the size are not distinctive of the type of disease or the pathogen. Um, they, they look quite similar among all the dieback type trunk diseases. And that wood that's discolored there is all dead. The vine has to work with what's left around it. Esca is better seen, um, the symptoms are better seen later in the growing season compared to the dieback type trunk diseases, um, typically between verasion and harvest. And usually it's around July when they first appear. These leaf symptoms are thought to be due to, in part, toxins that the fungi make where they reside in the wood and those toxins get carried out to the shoots. Um, these symptoms of ESCA are extremely variable from vineyard to vineyard. They include always though, some amount of scorching. It can be around the edges of the, of the leaf. It can be in between the veins. And then they'll often include some amount of discoloration. It can be yellow, it can be red, as in the case of the Chardonnay leaf here. Um, uh, these symptoms will be pretty consistent within the same vineyard from year to year in, in exactly how they look. And these are the very characteristic ones, which I've shown on Sauvignon Blanc, which is one of the most susceptible cultivars year, um, worldwide. Um, but uh, yeah, they're, they're incredibly variable from vineyard to vineyard. And that's, we think in part due to variable symptom expression among cultivars or different combinations of ESCA pathogens potentially. 
As I said earlier, ESCA does impact fruit development and fruit ripening. And sometimes the clusters will never visibly ripen up like they should. Um, and, and this usually happens on shoots that have the leaf symptoms on them already. Um, and so you can imagine if those toxins are being produced, they're keeping the leaves from functioning properly, that's going to also impact fruit development because you don't have the proper amount of photosynthase to ripen up that fruit. Um, and the toxins themselves may have some other impact on fruit ripening that we don't, you know, we haven't really pinned down yet. Um, one of the symptoms that can appear on the fruit is a, is a fruit spot or a measle. This is where measles or esca gets its common name of measles. And um, fruit that has these spots on it um, can sometimes be so heavily impacted that it cracks. Um, regardless, if you see the spots, you can be pretty confident that that fruit hasn't ripened properly. And often, you know, winemakers don't want to see anything like that in the vineyard. That fruit has to be dropped. If you cut into the wood of vines with those leaf symptoms or those fruit spotting symptoms of ESCA, you don't typically find the wood cankers. Um, instead, you see different types of wood symptoms. Um, one of those is like a black spot or a dark brown black spot. Um, typically, if you, if you cut through a spur or a cordon or even the trunk, and sometimes you can see these symptoms in the trunk below the graft union, you see these um, rings of black spots. They're kind of concentric rings. If you cut through it in long section, they look like lines. And then um, another set of escapathogens causes a wood rot. Here, um, kind of demarcated by this black line <clears throat> is a, a rotted, decayed section of the wood. And around it is healthy, apparently healthy looking wood. Um, like I said earlier, wherever it looks visibly decayed or decomposed or discolored, that's dead. The vine can't use that to function. ESCA can also sometimes cause a very rapid vine collapse, technically known as an apoplexy. And typically we get um, reports of this um, from vineyards that may have had typical ESCA symptoms in other parts of the vineyard. Um, or not, uh, it's, um, it's not the most common course of symptom development. Um, but what happens is uh, all of the leaves on the vine will wilt and the entire top of the vine will collapse and die. And this can happen in the course of five, seven or 10 days. Um, it's a very rapid vine collapse. And usually it's associated with wet springs um, and then prolonged, you know, week or two weeks of hot, hot weather, which is when in July is when we typically see that. 2017 was a bad apoplexy year in the most recent uh, past. And, and I've, I've put together these kind of these two conditions because I do want to um, mention that, you know, climate can have a big impact on trunk diseases, um, uh, whether it's symptom severity or just their spread. <clears throat> Before I get into talking about how they spread, I also want to mention the trunk disease um, or the disease young vine decline. Um, the ESCA pathogens team up with another disease called blackfoot disease or cylindrocarpon root rot um, to cause what we call young vine decline. And this is a three-year-old Grenache vineyard where some of the vines look very terribly stunted, others were incredibly vigorous. Um, and it, when we dig down into the roots to look at these vines, they have very few fine roots. Also, they have these types of symptoms. This is the black leg or the black foot from the root rot part of this disease. And then up in the, um, the trunk, in cross section, you get kind of like a dark discolored um, central pith area of the vine with this black ooze coming out of it. And this is what was called black goo, you know, back in the mid to late 90s. Um, we really started to notice this disease and Doug Goobler at the time was one of the people who really started to study this to figure out what was causing it. And it turned out to be, you know, some of the escapathogens combined with the root rot to cause what we call now young vine decline. Vines don't grow out of young vine decline. This is a 15-year-old Zinfandel vineyard. And um, 
the root rot persists, the, the infections in the trunk from the escapathogen persists too. Um, you can thin clusters, you can irrigate, um, but you know, this vineyard has had problems with shriveled fruit and unripe fruit for its entire lifespan. The, the infections are chronic, unfortunately. I've listed some of the pathogens that cause each of these diseases here. They're not um, all related to each other. Um, all they share in common is that they can cause chronic infections of the wood. Um, and for each disease, there's some different pathogens that can cause each of them. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, I forgot to mention this. I wanna say that um, trunk diseases cause what we call mixed infections. So often you'll find more than one pathogen or more than one trunk disease in a single vineyard. They get in through the pruning wounds you know, over time and build up these infections. And it can be different pathogens in different years that are predominant for whatever reason associated with the climate that year. <clears throat> these fungi can spread by spores that um, we know that rain is important in the production of the spores. Um, we don't know much more about the climate conditions that are necessary for all the steps of spore dispersal and then spore germination and then infection. Um, all we know is that well, the rain definitely brings out the spores in the first place. And depending on the species of pathogen, that dispersal of the spore can be by rain splash, it can be by wind, um, and some of the pathogens, uh, uh, some of the escapathogens, for example, um, their spores have been found in the soil. Now, whether or not that means that that that's how they spread, and that's an important means of spread is not clear, um, but they can come kind of get at the vine and affect in different ways potentially with that so soil borne phase, if that is the case. We know that um, spores can spread um, after fungi infect a vine and make their way out to the surface. They can make spores that can then spread to neighboring vines or distant vines in the case of Eutypa, which is spread by wind. Um, some tree crops host some of the same species that cause trunk diseases of grape. Um, it's also true for some native trees. And often, um, you know, nursery stock is blamed for certain infections. Um, and, you know, I just wanna say that there have been a few studies on nursery stock showing that it can get infected by some of the trunk pathogens. Um, some of the escapathogens are more infamous in this realm. Um, but we as scientists don't know, you know, when we find an infected vineyard, there isn't really a good way to say the infections had started at the nursery or they came from neighboring vines or they came from outside the vineyard. There isn't a way to parse out that information as of yet. Just consider these as all different potential sources. The fungi that cause trunk diseases need wounds to get into the vine. And the, the pruning wound as the entry point is probably the best studied. Um, among researchers. That said, they can get in through wounds caused by mechanical harvesters or even winter injury. Also, vineyards that have undergone a major change in their training system, um, in their pruning uh, regime, where at some point in their past, you know, they had to have some massive cuts made to them, um, those can be an entry point too. I apologize for all the text on this, but I kind of wanted to give credit to where credit is due for these studies. Um, most of what we know about wounding and how, how trunk pathogens get into the vines has been done with pruning wound susceptibility studies. Um, and I've listed a number of studies that have been done on the Botrysphaeria and Eutypa dieback pathogens in California. Um, these studies have generally shown that um, if you make pruning wounds in early winter, like in December, those wounds can take up to a month to heal. They're susceptible rather for a month potentially. Whereas if you make those wounds in late February and early March, they're susceptible or, or rather they, they heal within a matter of days. So the, the management decision we would make based on such data is to delay pruning as late as you can until late February, or early March. Another option, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a technique called double pruning um, to help break up your 
pruning um, work into two pruning passes. There's been some conflicting results relatively recently from work in Australia, in South Australia and New South Wales, showing that related, um, and some of the same species of pathogens that cause both Botryosphere and Eutypa diebacks, um, they can, um, the, the pruning wound susceptibility is a little bit different there. Um, it, whether you prune early in winter or late, um, the, the wounds heal within a week or two or three weeks, um, depending on the pathogen. Um, so there they don't see a pattern of susceptibility changing throughout the course of winter. Doesn't matter when you prune in winter, those wounds are susceptible for the same period of time. So if that is the case, then, then we would recommend that you put on a protectant after pruning, no matter when you prune. And then lastly, I wanna mention some work that Akif did years ago when he worked for Doug Gubler as a postdoc. Um, you know, he did pruning wound, pruning studies where he'd make pruning wounds and then inoculate them with different um, ESCA pathogens. And he found that those wounds could stay susceptible for months. And so in that case, it's like, it doesn't seem to matter what you do, you can't delay pruning, you couldn't put, apply a protectant unless you did it over and over again. And indeed those findings are consistent with work done on, um, you know, testing the efficacy of delayed pruning or protectants against some of these same ESCA pathogens. They, we just have not yet find, found things that work well against them, unfortunately. <clears throat> The technique I mentioned earlier as an alternative to delayed pruning is called double pruning. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it involves doing, um, some people call this pre-pruning. So it involves doing a pre-pruning pass early, early in winter when it's convenient for you. Often it's done with a mechanical pruning machine. You cut back most of the canes and then leave them there for um, you know, a few months until you come back in late February and early March and make your final pruning cuts. And with that, you're cutting away a bit of the cane that may have become infected at some point between the pre-pruning pre pass and then your final pruning cut. And then you're, you know getting that off of the vine. And then the pathogen doesn't have a chance to work its way down into the spur or the cordons. These pathogens grow quite slow. So that's why this strategy works. And um, Doug and Ed Weber and um, you know, other, other folks from Doug Gubler's lab tested this technique for Eutypa, the Eutypa dieback pathogen. Um, you know, it hasn't been tested against all the rest of the pathogens, so some more work might need to be done with this, this technique. I want to also list some of the different pruning wound protectants that have been shown to be effective in a range of studies overseas and here in the States. Um, and, I, and this isn't meant to be an endorsement, so I'm just listing a few of them. Um, pruning wound protectants like Topsin M or various formulations of pyroclostrobin seem to be effective against a broad range of trunk pathogens. Also, that's been shown to be the case with BLOC or boric acid paste. I also want to mention organic materials that are labeled in California. Um, you know, one material that you may have heard of is called Vitaseal. Um, it's not a fungicide at all. Um, it, it is potentially long lasting, which would be in contrast to the fungicides, which are really only effective for maybe a week or 10 days. They're not effective for very long. Vitaseal though has the potential to be effective for longer. Um, I, I believe BLOC is labeled for organic vineyards. And then I also just quickly wanna mention Serifel is a material we've tested that you know need, needs some more testing, but also I want to just mention biological controls in general. They're not totally, um, you can't just think they're going to act exactly like a fungicide. They may need multiple applications to be effective. And then lastly, I want to leave you with this thought that um, you know, your pruning and your training system will impact disease severity over time. And it's important to do everything you can to minimize wound number, size, and where those wounds are on the vine. Because when you cut into the vine, it goes through a natural he healing process that kills off a bit of the wood at the end where you cut it. 
And then also after I showed you all those cankers and discolored wood, you know, all that wood gets killed by the trunk pathogens as well. So years of infections and years of wounding lead to lots of dead parts of the woody part of the vine. So whatever you can do to minimize that is gonna be important in the long run. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing. I think there's one question in the okay. chat. Or, or sorry, not in the chat. Oh, there's two now in the Q&A. The first one is, what is uh, CAB most susceptible to? Ah, that's a good question. I know that, um, you know, from trips I've made to South Australia, I, I, where, where Eutypa lata is the most, seems to be the most predominant trunk disease, the Cabernet Sauvignon vines look terrible in, in their research vineyard that's, um, that's part of the South Australia research station. I forget, forget exact, exactly the name of it. Um, so the cab is like almost totally dead compared to some of the other cultivars. That said, um, you know, that doesn't mean it's more susceptible to all the other trunk pathogens because the fungi aren't related at all. So um, I can say like, for example, um, the table grape cultivar Thompson seedless seems to be incredibly susceptible to the Fomopsis dieback pathogen, but it's not more susceptible to Eutypha <clears throat> dieback also. There are a couple of other questions and I'm wondering if you wanna sort of type maybe answers to those and we'll move on to the next. Sure. Here, if that's okay. I can do that. All right. And let's see. All right, looks like Caroline has also put your email in the chat. So that way people, Perfect. if they have specific questions, maybe they can email you as well. Sounds good. Thanks All right, so our next, <laughs> thank you very much, Kendra. I really appreciate you speaking today. No problem. <laughs> our next speaker is Kent Dane. He is a UC Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management at UC Berkeley. And he's gonna be talking about mealybug controls today. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Thank you for being here with us. Sure. Thanks everyone for attending today. Um, wish we could be there in person. Today I'm gonna to talk about mealybugs and I'm gonna focus on different controls. So this is a combination of a number of different talks I've given in the past. And for that reason, I'm gonna go fairly quickly through these controls to show how they work on two different mealybug species, um, vine mealybug and grape mealybug. And I wanna thank the folks that work with me on these different projects. Um, we're gonna focus mostly on chemical controls, but I'll touch on different aspects of each control method. And because we're not there in person, um, I heard from Karen that they're giving out the emails, but here are my two emails. They're linked to each other. My last name is weird with uh, two A's in it. So if you just Google my last name, you find my contact information. If you've got questions that we don't go over today because we're going so quickly, please do go ahead and email me and I'll try to email back a response if I know it. So. These mealybugs, uh, for the most part, what we've been dealing with in vineyards in terms of insect control have been a series of invasive insects over the years. Um, you've got everything that seems famili familiar right now, such as the Western grape leaf skeletonizer, phylloxera, Argentine ant, obscure mealybug, long-tailed mealybug, Variegated leafhopper, light brown apple moth, glass and wing sharpshooter. These are all invasive species, including most of the mealybugs that we're dealing with today. One of the things to think about is that we've got this new concern now, the spotted lantern fly. It really is a uniquely pretty insect. It's uh, not a moth, it's a fulgorid. You can tell from the brightly colored nymph stages and when you see the adult, you can see that it's um, more closely related to a leaf opera than to a moth. Uh, this is now a 
test in Pennsylvania in the East Coast. Uh, it has been found in California, but not known to be established at this point in time. So be on a lookout for this uh, very obvious adult. Um, you can see the kind of damage it will cause on a grape. You can see the adults right there next to the berries. They're about berry size. If you find this anywhere, go ahead, call the county, a commissioner, county director, contact me, contact CDFA, contact somebody. Uh, because Ken, your sound is cycling in and out a little bit. I don't know if you're further away from your speaker, from your mic, or if there's a fan going in the background or something. Should not be a fan. Um, am I clear right now? Yes. I'll try to speak up. Thank you. So just be sure to keep on the lookout for this insect pest. Um, today we're going to talk about mealybugs. Most of the mealybugs that we've got in California vineyards are invasive species. Vine mealybug in the larger picture, obscure mealybug, which is in the Madeira Mariposa Merced area, but not as prevalent as the grape mealybug or vine mealybug. You really don't have to worry about the long tail mealybug or the gills mealybug. Long tail is typically a coastal pest of vineyards. Gills mealybug is in the Sierra foothills, but I've not seen it in the valley yet. Um, so Mariposa Merced, um, Madeira, really it's the vine mealybug. And in the insert, that's the great mealybug, the one native species of these five. And of course, the reason we're worried about mealybugs in wine grape vineyards, particularly, is not so much because of the damage they're causing directly, but because all of these mealybugs are vectors of grape leaf roll associated virus. A picture from Deborah Galino showing the spread. Akif is going to talk about sudden vine collapse. And we have to remember that. Mealybugs are a part of that in some way because sudden vine collapse includes uh, grape leaf roll associated virus as well. Um, again, most of these are invasive. Think about how many millions of dollars of cost lost in California because of the vine mealybug. It's a Mediterranean species seen in green around the Mediterranean Northern African area. In red is where it's now found. Uh, so it's in California, Mexico. It's in South America. It's in South Africa. And in California, we believe it was an accidental introduction brought in probably by a grower bringing wood in from Israel. And I've shown this before. This is a kind of a phenology of different mealybugs from around the world. These are all vine mealybug. We see up here in yellow is the California population, very closely related, same population found in Mexico, um, very closely related to a population in Israel, so close that we're sure our California and Mexican population came from Israel, more distant related to Western Europe and South Africa. And you can see the relationship that South African invasion probably came from Western Europe, Argentina probably from Western Europe. Uh, so uh, ours probably came from Israel, uh, same with Mexico. So in terms of different controls, we'll go through this fairly quickly, biological controls. This is why it's important to know the difference between a grape mealybug and a vine mealybug. The grape mealybug really is underneath excellent biological controls. I'm not seeing it as much, especially in the San Joaquin Valley, not so much because of the biological controls, but because of all the insecticide applications that are going on for the vine mealybug. We've got three native wasps that attack this native grape mealybug, two acerophagus, uh, are the most important, Acerophagus angelicus and Acerophagus notitaventris. Um, these pretty much keep the great mealybug to such low levels, most vineyard managers don't know they have it. And in fact, before the vine mealybug, 
all the spread of leaf roll that we saw going on was the result of the grape mealybug for the most part, or the European fruit lacanium scale. Both kept at such low densities, we just didn't think that a mealybug was a problem in that vineyard. For the vine mealybug, there are some biological controls. Um, the most important is this Anagyra pseudococci. Uh, there's an Israeli strain that we brought in, a southern Italian strain, northern Italian strain. But we're very, we're seeing more now this eastern Spanish strain that I brought in in 2008, which is spreading now throughout the Central Valley. Um, that's larger picture of the kind of coppery insect with a white antenna, that's the female. Um, if you look at the lower left, the black insect with the spiny looking antenna, that's the male Anagyra pseudococci. We brought it in also from South Africa in the upper right, that's a Coxidox anoides peregrinus. Um, I just found some here at Kearney a few years ago, so it has established. It's not killing as many of the vine millibug as the anagyrus, but it is here now in California and slowly spreading as well. Um, just a map of where we brought this material in from, that's the Coxinoxinoides peregrinus that we brought from South Africa and the populations we brought in from Northern Italy, Southern Italy, Spain, uh, and Israel. And again, I think it's the material from Spain which is doing the best. We can tell these apart genetically, morphologically, you cannot just look at them and tell them apart. So how good are these things working? Well, one of the problems is that they do a very good job against the mealybug found on the leaves, found in the grape bunches, found when it's exposed, it doesn't do as good of a job on the mealybug in protected locations. And with a vine mealybug, you always have a portion of the population under the bark, and at times even under the soil line associated with ants. Um, another problem is that its timing is not good for us, it's good for it. And so this is a trial that I did where I exposed vine mealybug in November, December, January, February, March, and April to the parasitoid. And you can see in the kind of open bar, that's where I left the mealybug outside. The black bar is where I put the mealybug into the insectary. So indoors, the parasite emerged after about three weeks. Outdoors, the parasitoid emerged beginning of May, regardless of when we exposed it. That's so the parasite comes out when the mealybug is starting to move out from underneath the bark and into more exposed areas. Again, because, and I'll show you in the next slide, it doesn't do well finding and parasitizing the mealybug when it's located under the bark. This delays its increase in numbers because for some of our vineyards, we've got the mealybug going onto the leaves in June and July and into the clusters in July and August. And that gives the parasite only a few generations to catch up to the mealybug, which starts to have generations turning over in February and March. Remember I mentioned the parasite does well on exposed mealybugs. So here we're looking at mealybugs for the most part on the leaves in the open circle, this one right here going up reaching parasitism levels as high as 80%. This is why you oftentimes see in your vineyards a population starting in June and July, the vine looks kind of nasty, but by August and September, you've got mostly dead mealybugs on the leaves, even though you can see the remnants of the mealybugs. The problem is that 
when you pull back the bark, you can see percent parasitism of mealybugs in this refuge area in the upside down solid triangle is very low, never reached more than 20%. So that's called a refuge from parasitism. And that means there's always a population of the mealybug which is hidden away from the parasite and protected. There are other kinds of natural enemies than these parasitoids, and these are predators. The difference between a parasitoid and a predator is that a parasitoid completes its life cycle from egg to adult in one host. So with parasitoids, it's killing many by laying eggs in different hosts, with each going from egg to adult in a single host, whereas a predator will kill many hosts, many prey, to complete its life cycle. So going clockwise from the green lacewing, feeding on a great mealybug, green lacewings, you could purchase these from insectaries. The mealybug destroyer, we see the adult beetle and the larva. You can purchase these from insectaries. In the lower right, that's a skimnus, which is a native beetle, it has got the same larva as the mealybug destroyer, looks like a mealybug. And then in the lower right, that's a predaceous midge. Um, again, you can purchase the lace wings and the mealybug destroyers if you want any more details on my opinion about that release program, you can email or call me. Typically, predators work best when the mealybug is at high densities. So the parasite is better at keeping mealybugs at low densities. You have to release a lot of predators to knock the population back to low densities. We're also looking this year at nematodes. Um, typically thought of more against Lepidopterum and beetles, uh, but they will attack mealybugs. You can see a picture there of a host with all those little wormy things in the microscope slide. We're going to play with releasing nematodes to see if we can't get some control of the mealybugs underneath the trunk. Typically, nematodes have not been thought to work that well in California San Joaquin Valley because it's so hot and dry, but maybe they will work under the bark with that refuge population of mealybugs. So we'll give that a try. Very briefly, mating disruption. This is only for the vine mealybug, but I will mention that this year we're testing mating disruption for the grape mealybug. So possibly something will be on the horizon for that species. So for the vine mealybug, we've worked with all kinds of dispensers. We've worked with puffers. We've worked with sprayable formulations. We've worked from Napa to Lodi to Fresno to Bakersfield to San Luis Obispo. I think the kind of product you use is not as important as getting the pheromone out into the vineyard. We see here in closed circle, typical mealybug pattern with an insecticide being applied in open circle, the mating disruption, capture of males in a vineyard with mating disruption. So basically you're getting zero, often referred to as trap shutdown. Um, the pheromone we used in this one was a Pacific biocontrol rope dispenser. Uh, Email me for the advantages of the different kinds of applications. So for example, the Pacific Biocontrol Rope Dispenser seemed to last the entire season. The sprayables last for about four weeks. So you have to spray five to six times to get season long control. You have to decide if you're gonna spray season long or early season, late season. Um, so email me if you've got questions about this, but again, I think the most important thing is getting pheromone out into the vineyard. Here's an example of how it works. We see in yellow control in red 
mating disruption in an 80 acre wine grape block. The graph below is the wind direction. So it's going from north to southeast. This graph shows in blue, no muley bugs and green a little bit more, in yellow a little bit higher, and in orange and red a lot of muley bugs. Uh, this is from May 2018, beginning of the trial. So you can see over on the east side of the block, we had a problem down here as well. This was just as the pheromone was going out. We can see by October a shift, more mealybugs over on the west side of the block in the mating disruption, cool blue, mating disruption, cool blue, yellow, yellow, green or yellow. Um, we see in 2019 when we continue this, Beginning of the season, on the windward side, up the upwind side, we still have got some mealybugs. Downwind, we have very few mealybugs, cool blue. So started the season off with almost no mealybugs. At the end of the season, upwind, still have some mealybugs. Downwind, with mating disruption, nothing downwind from mating disruption in the control, very little. And in the last control, a little bit of millibugs forming. So the size of the mating disruption plot, the wind direction will have an impact. So if you're in Carneros and you're trying to do mating disruption on a small five acre block with all that wind, probably won't work as well if you've got a hundred acres going into mating disruption where you're controlling a larger area. So for mating disruption, let's say you've got a vineyard, you're not monitoring very well, you get a mealybug density in one spot, you're gonna have to use insecticides to control that concentrated mealybug population. The insecticides bring the population back down, but there's probably spread and now you've got some mealybugs in isolated areas. Mating disruption helps to lower that spread and keep the mealybug density low. So it's used as a prophylactic as much as controlling a small population. If you're worrying about leaf roll, you still want to rogue the vines out. Uh, one study showed that you want to keep roguing up to about 20% of leaf roll infected vines. Get that population low where you can control it only with mating disruption and natural enemies. There are some cultural controls that you can use. Uh, we see here a picture of girdling a vine. Whenever I see a girdle mark, that's often where I strip the bark and look for mealybugs right above and below the girdle. And that's what you're seeing here in that video. And you're seeing the ants working the mealybugs as well in that video. So one thing you can do, there's the, the mealybugs. One thing that you can do as a cultural control is to ban the trunk and put some stickum on it. Uh, that does prevent some of the mealybugs from moving up, but it's very costly. A picture from Chile, they wrap burlap around the trunk and spray it with Lorsban. That works. We cannot do that. I looked into all kinds of techniques like that, not allowed in California. Uh, we have had people in the past strip the bark, hand strip. They even used a water blaster. That does lower the mealybug density, but I'm not sure how good that is for long-term health of the vine. We're going to see a talk later by Helen about water recharge. I'm very interested to see if this kills the mealybugs on the roots by having water there all winter. And another cultural control is getting rid of this cosid moth. Uh, you've seen this in the Fresno area. I wanna point out over here, that's the moth larva. That's the moth larva. We're finding associated with this moth 
uh, vine mealybug because it chews out a little area that protects it from insecticides and from natural enemies. And that's what the adult moth looks like over here. So very quickly to, con to conclude this with chemical controls. Um, these are some of the popular chemicals we're using these days. Spirotetramet or Movento still seems to be the best. Um, and we are working with growers in different regions of California, looking at the potential development of resistance. Email me if you've got questions about Movento use. There are the group of neonicotinoids. Uh, here we were looking at Belay, but it's the Admire, the Platinum, um, the Belay, the Neonix. Applaud, which can still be used as a delayed dormant uh, or in season, depending on where your grapes are going. A sale, all did control uh, to some extent. Here's the general problem. So you've got the mealybugs underneath the bark starting to move out in early spring to the canes, then to the leaves, and then to the fruit. That means if you look here, what we're doing is a whole vine sampling where we're looking for mealybugs throughout the season. This is what we show. In color are exposed mealybugs on the bunch, on the leaves, on the new canes, on the old canes. In black and white are the hidden mealybugs under the bark, on the cordon, the trunk, down at ground level or on the roots. What I'm showing you is that during a good portion of the year, that's where the majority of the mealybugs are located. And um, even during the summer, when you see the mealybugs in the fruit on the leaves, there's still a lot of them hidden and protected. And most of our insecticides, most of the natural enemies don't do well against that population. So there's this refuge from insecticides and natural enemies. Um, so going through throughout the season, Admire Pro gave us control. Um, after harvest, it kind of broke down in this recent trial, 2019 trial. Uh, so we uh, are going to keep in contact with Mark Sisterson at the USDA, who's looking at resistance of Neonix to some of these mealybugs. Here's a trial with Savanto and Movento. You can see Movento is still our best product. We'll add Savanto right now. There's Savanto as a drip. So it did pretty good, pretty good season long control, broke down a little bit after harvest. Here's Savanto compared to the drip as a foliar, it did a little bit better. Um, we're gonna look at this again this year just to make sure that it did work that well. This is a late season application. So it went on uh, in early July when the mealybug was exposed. We're continuing, as I mentioned, to look at Movento, our best product, using this device called an HPLC to see if any resistance is forming because we've heard reports that Movento is not working quite as good as it used to. There are a number of organic materials, neem, pyrethrin, soaps, oils, diatomaceous earth. We tested these materials uh, with Luca Brillante at Fresno State. None of them provided great control compared to our no spray water spray control. Um, we had a reduction of mealybugs in this block by the end of the season. And that was attributed mostly to the Anagyrus pseudococci parasitoid. Luca is going to continue some of his efforts looking at these organic materials, but they have not shown as much promise as the synthetic materials. We're also looking at post-harvest sprays 
and delayed dormant sprays. Again, we saw applaud worked very well as a delayed dormant. We tested it last year as a post harvest. And this is an October trial where we put it on beginning of October. First counts showed some promise. December counts, not as good, but we're gonna go back out this spring and see if we continue, if there was any continued impact from these post-harvest sprays. And I'll also mention that if you are thinking of improving natural enemies, you do have to think about ant controls. We hope to work with folks in the Lodi area and the Madeira area. I saw Mark is one of the participants. Uh, we're looking at alternatives to the corpyrus sprays. Um, I know Mark tested some of these polyacrimine gel baits. We, hopefully we can test these again, see if there's any potential for these compared to the protein baits, which don't work well for the Argentina. So in summary, um, one of the issues I've got with chemical controls, biological controls is that the vine millibug in particular finds a refuge under the bark of the canes, the trunk, and sometimes on the roots. And our insecticides, our natural enemies don't work well there. Ants are still an issue. Um, they especially are bad for natural enemies. But even with insecticides, if you have ants, the ants are keeping the mealybug under the bark or on the roots in a healthy, better environment. And so it improves that refuge population. Uh, for insecticides, the systemic materials tend to work best, but they still work better on, on killing the mealybugs when it's on the leaves and canes than under the bark of the trunk about a one-tenth to one one-hundredth reduction in the spirotectromat going enol on the trunk. I like mating disruption. I didn't show you information, but it works at lower rates than what you're used to using. And we'll have more information about that next year. So that was my 25 minutes exactly. I timed it. So I hopefully have stopped share and uh, the screen is back to you. Great. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat. One is, could you explain trap shutdown in relation of populations of females in the vineyard? So trap shutdown is a terrible term because it's only referring to what we catch in pheromone traps. It's an indication that the male mealybug is having a hard time finding the female mealybug because it's having a hard time finding the trap. But it doesn't indicate what's actually happening exactly because you can have trap shut down and still find mealybugs in the vineyard. So it's a signal that it's working, but you can find mealybugs in the trap and still have it working still have a reduction of suppression of the population. There is one more question, and I don't know if it's a short one, and if it's a long one, maybe you might want to type the answer, but what are you using, what are you using ant counts for in your sampling is the question. So we have got, over the years, we've had different ant samples. Um, the one we use for Argentine ant is the removal of a dilute sugar water from an upside down cylinder, which relates to the number of ant visits. Um, you can also just put up some duct tape around the trunk and count the number of ants going up and down that trunk section at a certain time of the day. Um, those are the two measurements we most commonly use. Thank you all. Thank you very much. For joining us and we really appreciate that was really an interesting talk they uh those mealybugs are getting smart right <laughs>
avoiding all the things that we are trying to do to limit them. Next up, we have Akif Eskalin. He's also a cooperative extension specialist. He's in plant pathology in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis. And the title of his talk is Understanding the Cause of Sudden Vine Collapse. Thank you very much, Akif, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Karen, for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to give you some of the information that we have gathered from last two years research. So uh, today I'm going to give you some um, information about understanding the cause of the sudden wine collapse, which used to be known as um, mystery wine collapse. Uh, since we start working on this problem, uh, we have now better understanding what the causal agents could be. Uh, we changed the name uh, as sudden wine collapse. So in this study, um, uh, I have collaborated with um, uh, mostly Dr. Mahir al Rawahani, who is the virologist in our department who has done the most of the viral uh, part of the, this uh, research. Uh, so the, the rest of the researchers have helped us uh, setting up the, this trial and then uh, helping us understanding uh, these uh, sudden wine uh, collapse. So this disease has been uh, around since 2010, 2011. Um, uh, it causes sudden death of the wine in the middle of the summer, which is also known as the apoplexy. As Kendra mentioned that the, some of the grapevine trunk diseases could also cause this kind of uh, the apoplexy. What I'm going to try to convince you that the, the sudden wine collapse is, is, is the complex of the, of the the, the viral and also grapevine trunk diseases. So we are gonna go through uh, step by step. So this specific, uh, the, the disease has been uh, seen specifically on the freedom rootstock. If you see these kind of problem on other rootstock, it could be causing something else, uh, but the, this uh, sudden wine collapse is mostly showing up on freedom rootstock, just to make sure that one. We have also seen a slow decline on uh, 5PB rootstock, as you can see in these pictures. Uh, it shows like the, the sunburn kind of the symptoms, uh, but not quite apoplexy. Uh, so we just identified this one last year, and then uh, we are gonna uh, find out more uh, in our coming year, but mostly uh, die, diebacks or, or declines are on freedom uh, rootstock. As Kent mentioned that the millibug is the, is the present in all of the, these uh, southern wine uh, collapse associated vineyards that we have uh, found so far. The, the most characteristic uh, symptom of the disease is the patchy uh, kind of the decline or collapse in the middle of or beginning of, of, the, of the vineyard, as you can see. So this is like the most characteristic way of um, the sudden vine collapse. It could be in the same, um, the, the, the line, or it could be a, a patch, as you can see here. That's the most characteristic one. So in here, like that, I just want to show you how dramatic uh, this sudden vine collapse could be. In, this is the one of the vineyard in Lodi. On freedom, you can see that like the, how big the patches uh, could be on here. So when I first start working um, uh, cooperative extension in, in my current position in 2018, uh, this is the problem that was uh, brought to my attention. And then we start working on this one in collaboration with the Lodi wine grape growers. Those are the one who has been uh, seeing this one, uh, this problem the most and we start collaborating with them to, to get a better understanding. So we had a meeting um, uh, with the representatives of the Lodi wine grape growers. And here so you can see the Stephanie Bolton and, and uh, Charlie Starr who uh, also helped us uh, getting uh, uh, the, 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 the primary, uh, the preliminary research uh, results uh, from these studies. Later on, uh, we also did the quick uh, survey in other part of the of the of the California. Uh, we also found out that the 
that the, the, this problem could occur or has been shown or seen in Monterrey, um, in San Luis Obispo, in Fresno and Tulare counties. Recently, we also have detected in uh, Kern counties. So which means uh, this is the, is the problem um, has been uh, most of the grape growing areas where um, uh, the freedom rootstock has been uh, planted the, the commonly uh, in these areas. Uh, we haven't seen this kind of problem in the Napa Sonoma areas because the freedom rootstock is not that common in those areas. So that's also a pinpoint that the how rootstock is, is associated or involved with this uh, sudden wine collapse problem. So when we first um, uh, start looking at the symptom of the disease, the first symptom or obvious symptom that we have uh, seen is that the lack of the feeder roots on those declining or dead vines. So this is the one of them that we can see like the main primary roots, but you see less uh, feeder roots, which is the one uh, that have plants to, to get uh, nutrient and water from the, from the soil. In the, in, the, in the picture in the right that uh, I'm just showing that the how feeder roots are supposed to be on a healthy vine. That's like the, the picture uh, that I got it from somewhere else. So that just to show you the, the, the differences between the feeder roots. So later on, I'm gonna tell you that the, what is associated with the association of the, these sudden wine collapse with the root um, uh, complex at all. We also have seen the discolored roots, as you can see here, when you look at the, the inside of the roots, it's brown. So this is the healthy looking that you can just compare. Most of the, these discolored roots are, are are um, that we isolated some of the fusarium uh, so, or some of the, the grapevine black foot disease uh, pathogens uh, that are known to uh, also colonize the compromised uh, root um, uh, species. They could be also uh, the, the primary um, the, the invaders in the roots as well. So in this uh, slide that I'm just showing you the, like the, we also done some um, iodine starch content test, which is a very simple test that you can uh, apply in the field when you are working. So this simple test is, is showing us the, 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 the amount of the starch that accumulated in the, in the root area. So we just wanted to know if there is any and it starch accumulation differences between the those uh, roots that I'm gonna talk to you about, like the, uh, the, the we are talking about the uh, graft incompatibility caused by the group of the, uh, of the, the, the viral infection. So just I'm getting you ready, what kind of uh, the, 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 the examinations that we have done uh, from the, uh, the sampling that we uh, have done in 2019. So this is the, uh, the rootstock before the iodine. This is the rootstock. It looks nice. There is no, um, um, the, 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 as you can see, like the, the, the color changes. So when you have the color changes, that means that there is a starch in that uh, rootstock. It's, it just um, uh, shows that kind of uh, purple uh, kind of uh, discoloration. So in the, 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 the rootstock in the middle shows that, that there is no, um, the, the contamination or, or not contamination, there is no content of the starch whatsoever. So we also uh, have a hypothesis that the why some of those, um, the root suck doesn't have enough, a uh, good amount of the starch that they are supposed to be having from the, from the um, upper level of the canopy. So we have done a pilot studies um, uh, to understand um, uh, what the primary cause of the, these uh, sudden wine collapse. So, uh, so in 2019, um, we uh, selected four different vineyards. They were all different ages. And then they were uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay. So the, the, the variety was different, but most of the, these uh, vineyards were showing uh, the, the dieback on freedom. So the rootstocks were all freedom. So we chose the four, di four different vineyards. And then we tried to 
the the the, the had the sam sampling strategy uh, ranking the, the the plants from healthy looking wine to like number one and to the five is the completely dead um, the the plants because we wanted to have a, a, a an idea if the the healthy looking wine has any uh, sort of the pathogen that we are looking for uh, versus um, declining uh, grape wines. <clears throat> so we were uh, doing the sampling. Um, uh, when you don't know what you are looking for, uh, you just have to get the sampling from every single part of the plant to have an understanding if there is any other pathogens involved. In this case, what we did was like the, we collected samples from the spurs, cordons, trunks, root stocks, as well as the roots. Because when you look at the, the patchy kind of the symptoms, it looks like the, that could be a soil borne pathogen. So we, we didn't wanna miss out any, could be a Phytophthora or Vaticillium kind of the soil borne pathogen. We didn't wanna miss out. We just wanted to have an entire uh, big picture of the, of the, the pathogen involved. So those are the samples that we have done. Uh, the, 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 my laboratory was focused on isolating, looking for uh, fungal and bacterial um, uh, the pathogens. Um, the Mahir um, uh, has looked at the, if there is any viral or viroid involvement of the, these uh, samples. So this is the, the, the results that we uh, got from our, um, the, the pilot study. I'm just gonna go through uh, one by one, uh, we collected samples from the four different sites, as I mentioned, uh, different cyan, uh, same root stock, and then we collected three wines from each side, and then different ranking of the of the grape wines. So wine conditions in that uh, sampling was that some of them were advanced decline, declining, and healthy looking. So the first thing that we observed from all of these freedom rootstock associated declining, the feeder roots were not good enough. Uh, we have noticed that the lack of the feeder roots from even healthy looking ones in these uh, freedom rootstocks. When we look at the iodine starch test, most of the declining and advanced decline had the lack of the iodine starch test, but healthy looking had the plus, which means had to looking at uh, the, the, the root stock had enough starch that came from the upper level of the plant. The reason that we focus on the, those starch level is that the, it is known that or we know that the starch content is the, is the one that produced or helped grapevine to produce feeder roots. So during the, um, the spring uh, after the first shoot, before the, um, the, the flowering grapevine produce uh, carbohydrate, those carbohydrates goes to the roots, um, and then that carbohydrates turn into the feeder roots by the rootstock. Same mechanism happens after the harvest. When that kind of the starch start not coming from the upper level of the plant, that's the time that we can see the lack of the starch in these rootstocks. All of these vineyards had the millibug present, especially um, the, the, the can't uh, give you more information about that. Uh, so those are the, the something that the criteria that we just wanted to look at. Mahir al uh, has uh, collected the samples and then he identified uh, from the advanced and declining grapevines, he found combined infection of the grape leaf roll tree viruses and VT viruses. It could be GVA or GVF. When he look at the healthy looking, healthy looking had either a leaf roll tree viruses or vice versa, they were lacking one of each other. So all these declining ones show the combined effect of or infection of the leaf roll tree and VT viruses uh, throughout the sampling from the grapevine. We also, of course, uh, talk, look at the, the ESCA group of the, of the or grapevine trunk diseases, which uh, Kendra give you uh, the, the, the great information about it. Grapevine trunk disease 
this is a complex, more than 130, 140 uh, different uh, ascomycid group of the fungi involved. Uh, ASCA group of the pathogen are known to be associated with the apoplexy. But in this case, we found the grapevine trunk disease is different level of, of the, uh, the things. But the problem was, is that we couldn't identify single species of the, or single uh, group of the pathogen from each advanced and declining uh, the, 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 the grapevines. So that was the thing that we start thinking about the grapevine trunk disease in this case on, this, on the declining ones is the, is the contributor to the decline or the collapse of the grapevine. We also found the Fusarium solani, which is an opportunistic um, fungal soil worm pathogen um, uh, of, the, of the, many of the, uh, the woody plants uh, from the advanced and declining uh, plants. Sometimes we also found the healthy looking, but mostly advanced decline uh, plants that we found. So in here, uh, this is the picture uh, that we uh, took from uh, Monterey, the two uh, vineyards next to each other. The one on the left is showing the sudden wine collapse. The one on the right is the showing the, uh, the, 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 the normal, uh, good looking uh, vineyard next to each other. One is on the 5C, one is the Freedom Root Stack. This is also showing us that the, this sudden wine collapse is the is a specific the freedom uh, rootstock associated issue. As uh, Kent mentioned you that they give you the broad, awesome information. I'm not gonna go through, but uh, what we know so far is that the millibug is, is, is also involved with the sudden wine collapse by uh, transmission of the, or vectoring the VT viruses and uh, leaf roll three viruses. Okay, so here's the conclusion. Results from the, the from the this study that we have found that, that the all the declining symptomatic plants we isolated or identified leaf roll three viruses and which viruses. So these two viruses associated. However, we also isolated grapevine trunk disease pathogens and Fusarium solani. As I mentioned to you, we haven't identified one single uh, fungal pathogen associated or group of the pathogen, either ESCA or, or Bortosferia dieback, group of the pathogen involved in this one. Freedom rootstock is the, is the one that has been known and uh, the, the susceptible to the co-infection of the leaf roll tree associated viruses. So that was the research has been done by the Rohani in 2017. Moreover, Previous studies also showed that the viral infection could cause the graft incompatibility. That's the where our hypothesis come from. We think that the that the the the, the with the freedom root stuck, uh, leaf roll tree viruses and VT viruses are are both are causing the graft incompatibility uh, on the, on the grapevine to prevent the starch movement to the roots. Therefore, roots are becoming a starch depleted and then producing less feeder roots. So in this case, the, 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 as I mentioned, the graft union is, is the problem. I just want to mention here that the, this is the different than the, um, the, the black line disease of the walnut. Uh, the black line disease of the walnut is, is the similar concept, but in that case, rootstock rejects the infection of the virus. Instead of uh, having the virus, it just shut down. It kills itself. Therefore, you have the like the black line, and then plant is completely killing it. From the study uh, that isolation or uh, identification uh, by the viruses that um, Mahir has done, that he also found infection of the viruses in the rootstock. In this case, virus is able to get into the rootstock, but causing a graft incompatibility, which means at the preventing the movement of the starch. So therefore it's causing like a little bit over time uh, graft incompatibility. Okay, so this is like the, the what we have found so far. So we also know that the, some of those Fusarium solani or, or the, the associated soil-borne pathogens are 
are are the one that can colonize or attract it to the starch depleted roots. In our case, that could be the case that we have found. So most of the, our those um, the, the 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 root stocks were starch depleted because of the graft incompatibility in that one. Yes. So, so our final um, the hypothesis is that the interaction between the leaf roll tree and Bt viruses, including grapevine trunk diseases and Fusarium solani, are are the one that contributes to sudden wine decline. It is a disease complex, so the, all these uh, has to work. But the primary uh, problem starts with the infection of the leaf roll tree and Bt viruses on specific uh, freedom rootstock. So what are the management options? We don't have that much management options because of the complexity of the disease. We would recommend you to test to confirm the co-infection of the viruses in your vineyard if you have a freedom rootstock and if you see millibug in your vineyard. So millibug is the, is the one that, that could be transmitting the dose of the viruses in your vineyards. Millibar control is, is essential, as Kent mentioned you. So removal of the infection grapevine is important. That could be the source of the, um, the infection of the, if you cannot control the millibar, well, could be the source of the millibar, or could, could be the source of the VT viruses. Because as, as long as you have the VT viruses, that millibar is gonna be moving. Sometimes I get a question that why we have start seeing this sudden wine collapse since 2010, because as Kent mentioned that the, we have now some of the invasive, mill, invasive millibugs that has been um, the invading the California um, beginning of the 2000 and then, and then later uh, 2010. So those are the one um, that are able to transmit those uh, the VT viruses or leaf roll tree viruses commonly and then um, the, the, wherever we see the, um, the, the freedom rootstock, they just respond and then start having these kind of uh, problem. So if you uh, have to replace the, your vineyard, so use less sensitive rootstock, I would say stay away from the uh, freedom rootstock because now we have the uh, millibug everywhere. And as long as you have the millibug, if you cannot control 100%, they are the one who's gonna be uh, transmitting the uh, viruses, which is everywhere apparently. So good control of the grapevine trunk disease, as uh, Kendra mentioned that, uh, that these, these are the, 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 the primary aggressive group of the, the pathogen that cause different uh, diseases. Pruning wound protection is the essential so uh, you, you gotta have the, like the, the good control of the grapevine trunk diseases. Probably those are the one that is uh, the, the, the speeding up the decline or the sudden death of the uh, sudden wine uh, collapse in your vineyard. With that, I would like to thank the Lodi wine grape growers who, who helped us um, get the, the first funding and, and also better understanding what's going on with the sudden wine collapse. So this is the, my, uh, my lab crew. Um, I would like to thank them. So they are the one who has done the, all the hard work. I get the credit. Uh, so this is my lab website. Please feel free to visit. Uh, so we have in, the, in our website, not only we have the current information or handouts, we also have the field fungicide efficacy trials that uh, uh, not only my lab, also my, Dr. Gubler, my predecessor has been doing it. <clears throat> If you are looking for um, uh, what uh, pesticide will work on uh, any other uh, group of the pathogen that we work, so you feel free to take a look at them. So if you have any questions, if I cannot answer your questions, please feel free to send me email. Here's my email address. If I have time, I will be happy to answer your questions. There is uh, one question uh, currently in the Q&A and someone's asking, is the reason for grapevine decline based only in biotic factors or is it important to consider abiotic factors? Okay, um, it is the complex. As, as I mentioned you here, all the biotic factors are preparing 
grapevine for the collapse. These collapse are happening in the middle of the summer when the grapevine is most more vulnerable, lack of the feeder roots that they cannot provide enough water and nutrient in the plant, and then they just uh, collapse. That's the abiotic factor. But primary, uh, the factor is the biotic. All right. I think that's all the questions we have. I think, for, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And I appreciate your giving uh, your information and Caroline has also put that information into the chat so people um, can copy that if they didn't write down fast enough um, from your slide. Um, and if folks, like Akif said, if you guys have questions, he's willing to answer your questions. His email is there and also you can look at his website and we're gonna take a quick break for just a few minutes. Um, and meanwhile, we'd like to thank all of our extension partners who help us to be able to put these programs on for you. And we'll leave this slide up just so you can see who our extension partners are. We'd like to thank them all. And with that, uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back at about, in about three or four minutes or so to start the next half of the program. Thank you all very much for attending. Looks good. Morning, Helen. Good morning. <laughs>
You were running a couple of minutes behind. Maybe I'll just give people just one more minute and then we'll get started. Looks like we lost a few people, but hopefully they'll come back. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right, I think we'll uh, get started so we can stay as close to our time frame as possible. Our next speaker is Helen Dalkey. She is an associate professor in the Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at UC Davis, and she's going to be talking about groundwater recharge on vineyards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for the invitation, and hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about groundwater recharge in vineyards. Um, I've been working on groundwater recharge using agricultural fields for a couple of years now. And we just recently moved into testing the practice in vineyards, but I wanted to give a little bit of background before we get into some of the more technical aspects. So for those of you not familiar with uh, groundwater recharge or managed aquifer recharge, as we call it sometimes in the more technical term, so this involves a practice uh, where water, excess water typically during large storm events um, is diverted from rivers uh, onto various working lands. This, in, this can include fallowed fields or fields that do have uh, crops planted on them, like perennial crops or traditional recharge basins, but um, storing more uh, surface water when it becomes available underground uh, provides several benefits, um, including future water supply reliability. It can reduce uh, downstream flood risk, uh, it can provide a water store for drought years, um, and it can also, in some instances, improve water quality issues that groundwater may have in the subsurface, and it can also serve as a long-term climate change adaptation uh, tool. So it really can provide a broad variety of benefits um, to Californians as well as ecosystems in the state. And so when we... Uh, uh, flood agricultural land or cropland, uh, particularly if it has perennial crops planted, uh, several questions come to mind. Um, one of those being, for example, you know, what soil, uh, what locations are most suitable for the practice, which very much depends on the soils, but also, you know, water availability or water quality questions. In this talk, I mainly want to address the crop suitability question. So is uh, Agmore, as we call it, uh, or on-farm recharge, um, a practice that can be done on vineyards. And so one of the uh, uh, farmers that really uh, um, pioneered some of these concepts early on was, uh, or is still Don Cameron. He's the general manager of Terra Nova Ranch, which is located really in the heart of the uh, San Joaquin Valley. And he started flooding um, wine grapes on his farm from April to July. So really several weeks, if not months in 2011 and could uh, recharge over 1200 acre feet um, on these like uh, wine grapes that you can see here in the picture. And he even did that when they were leafed out. So really a time where we typically wouldn't want to think about recharge. So. Most of our recharge, uh, research currently is actually focused on uh, testing the practice uh, on crops when they're in a dormant state. So typically in the winter months, December, January, February. Um, but overall, we actually don't know much about which perennial crops are um, tolerant of this practice. If we do flood them with several inches in the winter um, of water, and so some of these numbers reported here in the table that has been published by Toby O'Gene, by uh, our soil specialist. Um, wine grapes here are listed with a um, fairly high tolerance. And this is really just expert opinion. So we asked several uh, farm advisors who, have, who, who are working with grapes and that was sort of the feedback we received. Uh, pears might be a good one too. Almonds are 
a little bit lower on the tolerance scale. Um, so far, there has actually not been done much research on groundwater recharge in uh, wine grapes or even table grapes. Um, this is the only study I could really find that has directly tested uh, ponded water for several days and weeks in a a uh, table grade vineyard. So this study here was actually done in Eastern Fresno County by um, yeah, several authors here, Jim Ayers being one of them. And what they found is, so they did a flooding experiment on Thompson seedless grapes that were at the time 24 years old. And they repeatedly flooded um, a section of this vineyard, um, so over a period of uh, four years, uh, between December and February. So they kept a six inch ponding depth. Um, the sand was a greenfield clay loam and they applied water somewhere between 3.7 feet and almost 12 feet per year, um, typically over a period of 32 days of continuous uh, flooding. And they found in response to these water applications, which again happened during uh, dormancy of the plant, that they could not observe any effect on food set, so the number of berries per centimeter of lateral. There was no significant difference in yield between the control and the flood treatment, except for the year 1984, the last one, where the recharge treatment actually had uh, 6.4 kilograms more yield per vine than the control. And they also could not find any difference in bricks, titratable acidity, pH, or the berry weight, um, except again for the last year when the sugar content was uh, significantly lower in the recharge treatment. So overall, no negative effects on the grapevine. Um, there was a little bit effect on, on the sugar content in the last year which probably can be mitigated by just not doing the recharge maybe four or five years in a row. So we are currently in the process of um, following up on some of this research by doing controlled flood experiments at the Kearney Research and Extension Center near Parlier in, uh, south of Fresno. Uh, we're working currently in two vineyards that are rather of old age, which is a little bit of problem. They are both more than 40 years old, which is really not um, the most vigorous stand that you can uh, think of. But um, the goal of this experiment, besides understanding what it does to the grape wines, is also understanding um, what effect recharge has on the uh, whole um, soil oxygen and water balance, as well as on the nitrogen budget that we have in the root zone, since there are concerns about uh, leaching more nitrate potentially from fertilizer applications to the groundwater. Um, so here on, the, on this slide, you can see our experimental setup. Uh, we have a larger vineyard shown on the left here uh, that we flooded for four weeks continuously last year, and we'll do it again this year. And then we have a smaller vineyard, um, which we flooded uh, two weeks continuously. Both are planted with a Thompson seedless uh, variety uh, on a Hanford fine sandy loam but uh, we did see that the uh, soil actually has quite, uh, or some slight differences in infiltration rates. So the uh, larger vineyard has a, has a smaller uh, infiltration rate or a hydraulic conductivity of only 0 0.02 meters per hour, while the uh, smaller vineyard has a higher infiltration rate of about 0.1 meter per hour. And that definitely makes a difference when it comes to drainage um, of the water after the recharge is, is for example, ended. Um, we have extensive instrumentation in the vineyard to really um, not only measure the water balance components, but also some of the nitrogen balance components, as well as the uh, plant response. So we measure soil moisture, electric conductivity, uh, um, air content in the root, uh, root zone, redox potential to see if there's any oxidation reduction reactions going on, soil temperature, and we have 
uh, suction cups in gas chambers installed to measure um, nitrous oxide as well as um, to take pore water samples to estimate um, nitrate and ammonium present in the water. Uh, flooding started last year uh, on February 25th, and then it went on for two weeks in the small vineyard and four weeks in the larger vineyard, and we had more or less no precipitation occurring during that time. So here's another picture of the uh, vineyard. You can see here the flood treatment. So we flooded uh, typically four or five rows at a time, and then these flooded plots were surrounded by berms that were made of the native soil. Um, you can see here some of the berms in the, in the front and on the side. And so um, to show you a little bit, uh, some of the preliminary data that we've collected uh, from the vineyard. So here uh, on this slide, you can see the larger vineyard um, with uh, that has, yeah, uh, the four week flooding. And on the right side, you can see some of the measurements that we've taken. The top one shows the uh, ponding level, so the water depth um, of the water that was ponded in the vineyard in black and precipitation in, as blue bars. The second graph shows the volumetric water content at three depth of 20, 60, and one, one meter. Uh, the third one shows oxygen content in the root zone. Uh, the fourth panel shows the oxidation reduction potential or redox potential and then the electric conductivity um, at the bottom. And so to walk you through here, some of the findings. So we had more or less a pretty good head in the vineyard. So if at least a 10 centimeter of ponded water at all times. And um, we could, from, from the mass balance, just the amount of water that was applied every day and uh, the ponding, we could estimate that the infiltration rate was about uh, 10 centimeters per day. Um, so not too high for that particular uh, soil and vineyard. Um, it took about only one day to reach saturated conditions in the root zone. So we also reached anaerobic conditions, so very low oxygen content um, fairly quickly. So that took only about a day until you had um, more or less no oxygen left in the root zone, which always impacts root respiration. Um, as well as microbial activity. And um, towards the end here, you can see the light gray bars in the background of the graph. So these light gray bars indicate the flooding that was happening. So we stopped applying water about halfway through or like two thirds through March. But then you can see that the uh, um, uh, redox conditions and like the low oxygen conditions um, prevailed for quite a bit longer. So it took about one week or so until the soil drained back to field capacity. And then it took about two to three weeks for the soil to go back to aerobic conditions where you actually had some oxygen entering the soil again. And this is in in large part due to, again, the low hydraulic conductivity that the soil had at that location. So in comparison, the, the uh, smaller vineyard that we flooded, um, which was only flooded for two weeks, um, we here, again, had a pretty good um, ponded condition. Uh, about again, 10 centimeters, but much higher infiltration rates of about 0.2 meters per day. And um, it took a lot longer to reach uh, anaerobic conditions in, in the root zone. And we only reached them really um, in, the, in the near topsoil. So the 20 centimeter depth centers in the light blue line here indicates we did reach anaerobic conditions, but the other ones kind of maintained about 10% oxygen. And um, the uh, recovery of that soil um, after we stopped flooding also was a lot quicker than in the big vineyard. So it only took about two to three days until we reached full aerobic conditions, which definitely um, is better for the grape wines. Uh, we also measured various uh, plant parameters, so we did not see any significant differences in pruning weight prior to the uh, recharge experiment. We did not see 
significant differences uh, in bricks and berry weight between the flood treatment and the uh, control. However, we had several challenges besides, of course, also a pandemic last year. Um, we had, first of all, damage from a severe hailstorm that occurred in, at the end of March, which knocked off a couple um, buds from the grapevines. And um, overall, we had very low yield. So only one and a half tons per acre um, and a low cluster count, which our um, uh, viticulture specialist mainly attributes to the old age of the vineyard. Um, and we had some, some issues potentially also with powdery mildew. And here's um, just another graph on the yield that we had in the two vineyards. So the small vineyard had um, a slightly smaller yield in the flat treatment, but it was not significant compared to the control. But in the big vineyard that was flooded for four weeks, we had a 33% yield decrease which was uh, significant compared to the control. Um, so yeah, so this is an ongoing story. We are repeating the experiments again this uh, spring just to dig a little bit deeper into some of the questions, also uh, pest management questions, um, since there is a little bit concern that the extended flooding and the cool moist conditions that that is creating really might uh, provide breeding ground for powdery mildew. Um, but for those of you thinking about potentially, you know, doing some recharge on grapes, which um, I definitely hear from, from growers that we cooperate with, um, many of them are mentioning that the flooding is actually beneficial and that the vineyards that they have that get flooded in the winter, you know, by naturally um, maybe having rivers going over the banks typically perform better than the non-flooded ones. But so if you do think about this practice, I can recommend using the Soil Agriculture Groundwater Banking Index tool that we have developed here at UC Davis, um, which is uh, a tool you can find online and it identifies suitable locations based on uh, five soil factors that we have combined here. Uh, root zone residence time, um, the rate at which water is percolating through the root zone. And so green areas here in this map, for example, uh, indicate suitable soil locations where the uh, recharge practice might be uh, good to implement or at least less damaging on perennial crops, um, but definitely suitable if you have fallow land, for example, too. Um, again, it uses several uh, factors um, that have been combined into one suitability index. And then the other tool I wanted to mention is um, this agriculture groundwater recharge assessment tool that we just recently developed for the Tulare Lake Basin. Um, this one combines the SACB index with other indices like land use, um, surface water diversion capacity, but also information on the socioeconomic status of many rural communities that we have in that area that um, sometimes only have groundwater as the only drinking water supply source and have um, faced major issues during the drought with wells going dry, but also uh, groundwater quality issues. And here, this tool is basically identifying uh, land parcels where recharge would um, benefit those wells and those communities because it would directly flow uh, towards those drinking water wells um, in those communities. So if you are thinking about recharge, uh, please take a look at this uh, webpage and see if maybe one of your fields uh, or maybe you're even in the process of planning uh, an info to put in an infiltration basin, um, the uh, selection of location of that basin um, can be guided with this tool to provide multiple benefits, not just, you know, pure groundwater recharge, but also uh, potential, you know, benefits to rural communities. And here's a little bit of close up. So you can see here we have um, actual farm field boundaries. So it's really uh, true to the latest land use survey that we have uh, here from the Central Valley. And uh, with that, I'm coming to my conclusion. So uh, on-farm recharge is really a viable option um, 
not because we have to just comply with the system of Brown Management Act, but it can provide several benefits not just for ecosystems, but also for our groundwater aquifers, uh, rural communities, uh, in-stream flows, et cetera. Uh, particularly if you are thinking about recharge, please take a look at some of the location recommendations that we've made since targeted recharge near communities can help the water supply in those communities. And for those of you who are working particularly with vineyards, um, soil type is still the main parameter for choosing a suitable location. You want to have a soil that is uh, able to convey quite a bit of water in a short time. And um, again, if you have lo water logging conditions and you have continuous water applications for several weeks, it can uh, potentially um, increase the risk for pests and uh, diseases in your vineyard, which can impact yield. And with that, I would like to thank my many collaborators, postdocs, and students who have contributed to the study, and I'd like to take questions. Thanks. So it looks like you do have one uh, sort of a comment. Um, it would be interesting to see what impact the flooding does have on soil borne insect populations. Have you looked at that? We have not. Um, that's a good, that's a good uh, question and we, uh, we can add that to our list. So uh, um, are there some specific species that um, come to mind that we should look out for? I know there are some wasps that are for example, burrowing in the soil, but any other, maybe um, the person can get in touch with me directly and, and send me some recommendations. Actually, yes. Yeah, so Caroline, <clears throat> excuse me, has put your email into the chat. So hopefully um, that person can email you and uh, let you know <laughs> what specifically they're, they're interested in. Great. Thank you very much for speaking. That was really interesting. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is George Zhuang. Uh, he's the Viticulture Farm Advisor in Fresno County. And um, he's going to be talking about the effect of mechanical leafing and water management on Cabernet Sauvignon. And there's George. All right, uh, Karen, can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, first, I wanna say uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, really thank you. Uh, Karen and Caroline for inviting me here to uh, give this uh, talk. Well, so, thank you for joining us. <laughs> so. All right, thank you so much. So let's start because uh, I think we're a little bit uh, running out of time. Yep. Um, so uh, basically uh, this project uh, uh, was funded by American Vineyard Foundation uh, since uh, 2019, but that project was uh, initiated the year before. So this is uh, a collaboration work between uh, uh, Fresno State, which is a, a uh, Dr. Sen from uh, Fresno State and my colleague Carl, and also the two extension specialists, Matthew and Kang from UC Davis. So uh, before I jump, jump into the, uh, the, the data and uh, the experiment, I just want to uh, you know, give you an overview of the, uh, the flow of this uh, uh, presentation. So first gonna talk about uh, the background, basically why uh, and how we approach this uh, uh, idea and then uh, the experimental design, how to you know uh, get some meaningful data to guide the industry uh, to you know uh, schedule irrigation and do uh, mechanical leafing. Uh, then we're going to share the three years uh, results, including the uh, yield and the fruit chemistry. And then uh, basically the last one going to be the take home message uh, from the three years uh, study. So uh, I, I saw some uh, audience here uh, from uh, you know the Fresno Madeira area. So this is quite straightforward for those uh, local. Uh, 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 um, uh, members, but in case you're out of uh, California, or out of uh, uh, San Joaquin Valley. So basically uh, the SUV here uh, represents San Joaquin Valley. So here we're talking about really from uh, Sacramento all the way to uh, uh, Bakersfield. So that's a large area. So uh, we produce about more than 50% of uh, California Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's a, a significant uh, player for uh, cab production here in California. Uh, however, the, it's very hot uh, weather uh, in the summertime, so it's very dry and, and uh, warm weather. Typically, it's not really a perfect location for Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, uh, based on uh, you know uh, uh, industry members. Um, typically, here in the Fresno area, the high production per acre is a key for profit. 
So basically, you know, the goals uh, to stay in the business, we have to achieve a, a minimum tonnage per acre uh, to stay in the business. And however, recently uh, there is a, a movement uh, for the wine industry to uh, move so-called uh, premiumization. So basically uh, try to produce high quality uh, uh, grapes and wine uh, to basically capture the, uh, uh, the marketing demands. So basically here for Cabernet Sauvignon, we are talking about the uh, uh, color. That's the number one issue uh, for a lot of winemakers. And then uh, tanning, um, it's basically the phenolic structure and then the green flavors, uh, sort of the mesoxypyrazines, uh, which is kind of green bell peppers. So those are the key components uh, for like desired uh, fruit chemistry, basically uh, for the, uh, for the valley, uh, valley wine industry. So uh, an approach uh, with uh, uh, different growers and different uh, wine industry uh, uh, members. Um, so we you know, figure out how can we you know, uh, better manage water and use the mechanic leafing to basically improve the uh, quality of Cabernet Sauvignon. So in this case, we're gonna use a, a, a Madeira County Cabernet Sauvignon. So Madeira County is a, a county north of uh, Fresno. Uh, in case you are not very uh, uh, familiar with the ge geographic locations for the San Joaquin Valley. So basically here we're looking at uh, four uh, objectives for this uh, uh, project. So basically want to improve the color. That's really the number one issue for this project. And then reduce uh, the green flavors as uh, mesoxypyrazines. And then uh, now that's also very important for the third one here uh, is really try to uh, 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 maintain the high yield uh, per acre because that's the, just the, the baseline for the uh, wine business here in the valley. And then of course, last one here, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, also improve the wine quality because uh, ultimately the winemakers can decide, you know, if this uh, uh, project is meaningful or not. So uh, uh, we choose the Cabernet Sauvignon at the west side of, west side of Madeira County. So uh, here we use a, a mature, Cabernet Sauvignon vines uh, grafted with uh, Freedom Rootstocks. Uh, I know I keep just uh, talk about the Freedom, Freedom Rootstock, but uh, most of the uh, great vines here are, uh, are planted with uh, Freedom Rootstock, which might be unfortunate uh, based on the uh, issue of a uh, sudden vine collapse. But on this study, we, I use a uh, uh, Freedom Rootstock and uh, uh, the, the raw orientation for the Cabernet Sauvignon is kind of like, you know, interesting. It's not like typical our row orientation for the, for the valley. Uh, so here was a, a, a northeast to a southwest with about 45 degrees. So basically the, the normal planting of wine grapes here in the Fresno is somewhere from east uh, to west row orientation. So in this case, this is a little bit uh, 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 unique setup for the uh, row orientation. And the row and the vine spacing is about 10 by four, which is kind of standard for the quad. Uh, so we use a uh, 22 inches uh, cross arm spur prune and the classic uh, sprawling system. So here's just give you some, uh, you know, detail of experimental design. Uh, you, you can take a look at more details here, but really just look at two levels of a water deficit. So the first water deficit here is a RDI, which means uh, regulated deficit irrigation. So uh, what does really mean here is really a, a very stress level from a, a fruit set to a variation. Then after variation, we you know, uh, reduce the stress level uh, to about 80% of ETC. Uh, so basically we try to stress more in the early season and then later in the season, we uh, reduce the stress. Uh, then the second one here is SDI, which is a sustained uh, deficit irrigation. So basically we use the same number across the whole season, uh, which is about 80% of ETC. Uh, then there's like uh, three different uh, leafings. So the bloom time uh, berry set, which is about pea size, and then uh, no leafing uh, as a third treatment here. So we did a little bit differently across the three years. So first year in 2018, uh, we only uh, did leafing on one side of the canopy. And uh, uh, in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, uh, we decided to do uh, both sides. So that's uh, uh, the major difference uh, across the three years uh, study here. So uh, how we set up about uh, irrigation, we try to uh, use the different emitters per vine to really set up the irrigation levels uh, per treatment. So basically you see a uh, two irrigation line here. So we set up a different amount of uh, emitters per vine uh, to give a different amount of waters per week. And then here's a mechanical leafing. Uh, so like I said, we have a three, uh, about two times, uh, which is a bloom and a, a, a fruit set. Then there's a no leafing at all. 
Uh, on this case, we use a Clemens uh, mechanical leafer, and uh, the picture on the right side, that's about a pea size. Uh, we finished the, uh, the second uh, timings of uh, leafing here. So during the season, uh, we really try to you know, use uh, Larry Williams uh, crop coefficient to schedule irrigation. So the 50% uh, of ET or 80% of ET is really coming from the uh, Larry Williams uh, crop coefficient uh, based on the, the canopy shade uh, 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 measurement. Then every week we try to use a pressure bomb to basically to make sure we are on the right track uh, for the water stress uh, level we want. So at the same time we did a you know the bunch of uh, uh, line measurements, particularly at the fruit zone. On this case here, uh, we did a uh, uh, use a light bar to measure how much light actually getting into the uh, fruit zone from different treatments, and also use a, a light core to measure uh, the leaf gas exchange. So at harvest, we you know, of course measure yield and then the harvest grapes to make actual wine uh, to see how the you know, wine chemistry uh, differ from uh, different treatments. So here's a, a, a result. Uh, I just, uh, you know, since there's so many data from the three years. So in this case, I'm gonna just give you a kind of like uh, representative data from one year uh, because most of uh, the case, the number are quite consistent uh, from you know, 2018 uh, to 2020. So in this case, I just give you one year as a, a representative data on this case. So here's a, a, a pressure bomb ratings, which is a, a leaf water potential. So uh, like I said, um, you know, the Y axis here is really the uh, leaf water potential and the X axis here is a, a data of year when we uh, took the measurement. And uh, the, you know, see the three uh, uh, blue arrows here indicates, you know, the, uh, the phenological stages uh, during the season. The first one here is a really bloom, a pea size, and a variation. So basically, uh, uh, the most significant uh, result we got is really from water treatments. So basically, every time you get a more stress on the vines, the pressure bomb ratings go lower. In this case, it's really from RDI, which is uh, about 50% uh, of ETC uh, before variation. So see, uh, consistently, there's about two bar uh, difference uh, between this uh, time of, uh, uh, of the season. And after variation, we you know, go back the same amount of uh, 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 ETC, the, the pressure bomb rating is about the same across uh, uh, two treatments. So the, number, uh, the, uh, the water amount we put on the ground really drives significantly the, the pressure bomb ratings uh, during the season. So of course, we measure lights. Uh, the most uh, you know, interesting thing we, we notice that we, every time you do mechanical leafing, uh, you increase light. And on this case, we did uh, you know, the bloom time here. Uh, a berry set and no leafings. Remember all the leafing here is done by a mechanical leafer. So basically uh, we look at uh, three different timings of the seasons. So here's a bloom time, uh, berry set and uh, uh, variation times. So uh, interestingly in the early seasons, the bloom leafing increased significant amount of light uh, for, uh, for the fruit zones. And however, we see a different uh, results based on the side of the canopy uh, you did on the mechanical leafing. In this case, when you do the uh, mechanical leafing on northwest side of the canopy, early season increased light. And however, after you know about two or three weeks, uh, the difference start to you know disappear. And even we did the mechanical leafing at a berry set, the increase was not significant for this side of the canopy. When you do another side of the canopy, it's kind of similar results, particularly early in the seasons. But uh, after uh, about the fruit set, when we do the uh, berry cell uh, mechanical leafings, on this side of canopy, actually we see an increase of uh, mechanical leafing uh, uh, on increasing the light here. So basically, uh, every time you do the mechanical leafing, it really depends on which side of canopy uh, you apply the, the leafings. You might see a different result in terms of light on the, on the cluster zone. So uh, one thing I want to mention that, you know, every time we do the mechanical leafing, uh, we're going to increase light. Also, the water going to increase the light or you know change the light at a fruit zone as well. In this case, when we do uh, like a, a water deficit before variation RDI here, we actually see a, a increase in terms of light on the fruit zone. So there's some kind of indirect impact every time you put more stress on the vines. The canopy gets smaller, then you're going to have more light on the on the can on the fruit zone as a result of a water deficit. So just give you ideas, every time you change water, you're also gonna change uh, the, the fruit zone light exposure as well. 
So also with the life uh, leaf gas exchange, basically I want to see how uh, how much you know different water treatment gonna uh, uh, change the the leaf photosynthesis rate. So you know it, this is kind of expected results. So basically every time you reduce the water and put more stress, you're gonna you know uh, close the uh, stomates on the leaves and shut down the photosynthesis on this case. So basically, um, uh, same times, basically bloom, uh, berry set, and uh, variation here. So after berry set, we kick on the uh, water stress. I would say immediately a uh, reduction of, uh, of a carbon assimilation. In this case, is a leaf photosynthesis rate on, on more severe water deficit treatments, So which is con very consistent across about three years. Uh, the mechanic leafing on the leaf gas exchange is kind of interesting. So early on, particular on the on the bloom time, when we do the uh, mechanic leafing, we actually see a little bit increase, uh, you know, uh, after after the mechanic leafing at the bloom times. And one of the reasons is because of the of the uh, the compensation from the vines, because you know every time we remove the leaves, we're gonna remove the leaf area. So the vines try to catch up with the the photosynthesis rate. So uh, typically we see a little bit. Uh, increase of the leaf uh, photosynthesis rate. But that uh, compensation only lasts about two or three weeks. After, after uh, berry set, when we kick on the water stress, uh, that compensation start to you know, uh, disappear. So basically uh, the compensation from mechanical leafing is really depends on the stage of the vines. And uh, typically the impact is like a short lived. So one of the significant results we see on the uh, berry ripening is uh, uh, every time we put a more stress, uh, early on, on this case as a pre variations we see a, a, a bit of a, a delay of uh, sugar accumulations across uh, three years. So this year we just gave you one year's data, but it's pre pretty consistent. So every time you stress the vine early on, we see about a, a, you know one breaks a delay uh, just across the whole ripening curve. So basically from variation all the way to harvest, we see a, a consistent uh, uh, delay uh, of the sugar accumulations from more severe water deficits early in the season. So how about the color? And the color is kind of uh, you know, interesting here. So basically look at separate things. On the left, uh, left side here is a, a water treatment. On the right side here is a, a mechanical leafing treatment. So basically every time we put more stress, in this case RDI, we see a little bit increase of a color through the, uh, the whole ripening uh, curve. Uh, and uh, leafings, kind of similar things. So basically bloom and a berry cell leafings increase the color. Uh, some, some years we'll see the uh, uh, mechanical leafing at a berry set uh, somehow reduced close to a uh, harvest uh, for the colors. But pretty consistently when we do a leafing, a bloom or berry set give us consistent uh, color increase uh, even through the whole ripening curve, uh, even at a, uh, at a harvest. So when we put the three years data together, we want to see you know, what's the, the correlation between the uh, breaks and the color. So here's the three years data. So uh, the red curve here is a, a RDI, which is more severe water deficit uh, pre variation And there's a black line, which is uh, you know, about 80% of ET uh, through the whole season. So three years consistently, we see a, a higher uh, uh, color increase based on the breaks. Uh, from more uh, severe deficit irrigation pre uh, pre variation. How about the uh, mechanical leafing? The same result. So basically, we see a very nice separations between the mechanical leafing at a bloom, very set, and no leafing. So in this case, you know, if you do mechanical leafing at a bloom, it give you the you know the highest color at the same amount of uh, breaks. Uh, depends on the harvest date, uh, you know, based on your program. So uh, one of the interesting thing from the uh, gores really to uh, try to understand what's the impact of uh, you know, different water treatments and different mechanical leafing on the yield. So here I just give you a gigantic uh, uh, table here, but you know, I think interestingly here for the, for the members here is really look at the yield. So here I put a tons per acre, uh, just give you more direct you know, uh, indications of the, of the water treatments on the, on the production here. So basically we look like across the three years, we see a consistently yield reduction about two tons per acre uh, from RDI, which is most severe water deficit pre uh, variation. Uh, you will see, uh, generally speaking, from 2018 to 2020, we have increase of, a, of a yield. On the first year, I will, put, I will point out here, the yield is quite low uh, based on the uh, production standard here in the valley. 
because in 2018, the goal did some uh, shoot thinnings uh, inside of the cross arm. So basically try to clean the, the cross arm to get more light exposures inside of the canopy. So this is artificially lower uh, compared to indus industry standards. So 2019, 2020 is mobile standard here uh, because the goers start you know, uh, stopping uh, um, uh, uh, doing the shoot thinnings on this uh, particular block. So basically the yield reduction, two tons per acre, really driven by uh, the, the berry size. So berry weight was really lower by the RDI treatment here across the three years. Uh, not much about class number and cluster weight uh, across the three years uh, study. So uh, when you look at the uh, mechanical leafing, one of the, uh, the important questions from the goer is really about the, if you do the mechanical pruning at a bloom, uh, do you see a severe uh, uh, yield reduction? In this case, three years, we just did not see the severe reduction uh, from uh, bloom mechanic leafing. In this case, you know, the first year, uh, it's about, you know, probably we lose about one ton per acre uh, compared to the low leafing here. Second year is about really the same, you know, less than half tons per acre. Uh, the third year is about really about half tons per acre. So, uh, you know, um, across the three years, we just didn't see a severe year reduction if we decide to do the mechanical leafing early, such as you know, bloom time. So how about the you know, mechanical leafing and the water deficits on the, uh, the, uh, the sugar? Basically, that's the, the mo most important thing because most goers, uh, you have a, you know, a minimal requirement for the breaks. So when we look at the three years data, we find uh, some interesting interaction here. So the leafing, generally speaking, you know, look at a lot of those uh, uh, previous studies or literatures. Every time we're talking about leafing, generally leafing is good for the sugar accumulation. But on this case, in our study, we found that depends on how much water you put on the vines. So if you, you know, put a, a, the normal amount of water, typically about 80% of plus EDC during the season, leafing bloom at a berry set gonna help you to increase the, the sugar levels at a harvest. However, if you decide to go more water deficit, on this case, RDI, leafing actually do more harm than good. Uh, basically gonna reduce your uh, uh, breaks level at a harvest. So this just uh, uh, tell you a very important uh, message. Generally speaking, leafing gonna increase the, the, uh, the breaks level at harvest, but really depends on how much water you put during the seasons. If you put the right amount of water, you know, there's a very min minimal or medium water stress. Typically that con conclusion is uh, a right. But if you decide to do a very severe deficit irrigation, leafing typically gonna reduce your uh, breaks at a harvest. So uh, the last part of the presentation here, we really look at you know, how the color difference uh, you know, from uh, water deficits and mechanical leafing. So one thing we consistently see, uh, see from the three year studies is really the bloom, mechanical leafing give you the highest color. And then the second one is berry set, then compared to a low leafing here. Uh, in 2020, we didn't see a statistic difference between RDI and SDI. Uh, and one thing we noticed that because there's a significant uh, color reduction uh, during the season in 2020. I think there's more probably uh, impact there from the vintage. In terms of IBMP, you know, three years consistently with the uh, uh, RDI or more severe water deficits gonna reduce the IBMP levels. Even though in this case, the IBMP is really low uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the, the targeted breaks for carbon sodium in the valley, typically somewhere 24, 25. When you get 24, 25 breaks, the IBMP level typically is very low in the valley here. So the, one of the reasons in 2020, we didn't see a, a, a statistic difference here across the RDI and SDI, because in 2020, we see a, a kind of dramatic uh, a color reduction, you know, uh, through the ripening curve. So basically the peak is somewhere end of uh, uh, August, then the cross the, you know, about one month and a half, we just see a slowly uh, degradation of colors. One of the reasons might be 2020, we just have a kind of bizarre year with a record heat before the smoke events. So we have a record heat before the, the wildfire. Then we have a three weeks of uh, cloudy and smoky days. So maybe there's some impact there. Um, not Anita gonna give more detail there. So I don't want to, you know, uh, talk about that more here, but you know, 2020 just kind of uh, like a, a strange year. Uh, in terms of ripening, let's put it that way. So then we make some uh, wine uh, with my collaborators uh, from Fresno State. 
Uh, this just give you the wine color data in 2019. Uh, the 2020 uh, wine color data is uh, still you know, uh, in the lab. So hopefully we're gonna provide the data in the next uh, months or so. But just give you ideas. So basically we have RDI, SDI, and then there's like, a, you know, uh, uh, over irrigation that put that way, 120% uh, of ETC. So basically on the wine color side, we see there's more uh, significant impact from deficit irrigation uh, from uh, uh, than the uh, mechanical leaf, leafing here. So basically the RDI seems to give you get the highest white color. Then on the RDI treatment here, um, leaf removals on the, uh, the broom time seems to give you the high, highest amount of white color uh, in this case. So just briefly, uh, just take home message. So there are a lot of data from three year studies. Hopefully we're gonna publish the data uh, uh, pretty soon in the paper. So, uh, you know, goers and the industry members can get more details from this uh, studies. So basically uh, we found water deficit pre variations improve the color. So basically on this case, RDI give you about, you know, 10 to 20% more color uh, compared to like SDI, basically the, the grower standards in this case and reduced IBMP two out of three years. So it's, which is quite powerful if you really try to manage the green flavors uh, for, the, for the Cabernet Sauvignon on the, on the case. And mechanical leafing uh, we found kind of unique or kind of surprising is that me mechanical leafing at a bloom time give you the highest color. So typically we have an increase about 20 to 30% of color uh, at a harvest and slightly increase the, uh, the green flavors. So uh, we only see this kind of result for the first year. So mechanical leafing at bloom give you a little bit higher green flavors at harvest. But you know, 2019, 2020, we didn't see the same result. So I'm not sure about this green flavors uh, at this point. Hopefully we can do more studies on uh, mechanical leafings on the green flavors. Uh, interestingly, we found there's an interaction between the, uh, the photosynthetic leaf area and the zone like exposures on the, uh, on the break, on the uh, berry breaks. So basically, you know, normally if you put right amount of water, leafing gonna increase the berry breaks. But in case you can decide to do a very severe deficit irrigation, then the mechanical leafing is harmful for the, uh, the berry sugar because you remove a significant amount of leaf area when you stress the vines. So the vines is really struggling to, uh, you know, uh, produce the sugars uh, for the clusters. So you just have to really remember that, you know, those uh, you know water treatments and the uh, the cluster zone light exposures somehow can be interactive uh, uh, in affecting the berry uh, sugar accumulation at the harvest. Then the water deficit pre variation does reduce yield. So in this case, we have consistently two tons per acre uh, yield reduction from the RDI, which can be significant. So uh, if you are uh, uh, goers, uh, you know you want to achieve the profit probably the water deficit pre variation is uh, not something you wanna do. And most likely the water deficit pre variation uh, reduced yield is driven by the uh, smaller berry size that is consistently across the three years. And uh, uh, I think the most important thing or most important uh, uh, result uh, we found from the studies that mechanical leafing at a bloom time result in very minimal yield reduction. So I got a lot of questions still from the goers you know, about mechanical leafing at a bloom gonna reduce the yield. But based on our three year studies, the reduction is really minimal. It's, it's just not significant there uh, to, you know, uh, become a very uh, concerning factors. So finally, I want to, you know, uh, thank all, all my interns and uh, the fundings, uh, American Vineyard Foundations and ETS Laboratory to help me to do the green flavor test. And uh, also want to thank all the uh, you know, wine grape goers and winery uh, members from the San Joaquin Valley to really support my uh, research program. Uh, finally, I think this is my last slides and uh, I think I use exactly 30 minutes. So uh, uh, let me know if uh, Karen, if there's any question there. I think the only one that's there is actually uh, an answer to, to Helen about uh, in, in the, the, last, uh, the last talk. So actually at the moment, there are not any questions in the Q&A. Um, Caroline has put your email address in the chat. So if people have questions, they can email you directly. Um, they can also ask them in the chat, or not in the chat, excuse me, in the Q&A. And um, we can have you answer during Anita's talk if people do end up 
um, putting some more answer uh, questions there. But I think in the Perfect. for time's sake, we should probably move forward because we are running a little bit behind. Thank you very much, George. That was great. It was good to see the data. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, we will move on to Anita Oberholster. So we'll have her share her screen. Okay. There she is. Hmm. Uh, let me just put it in presenter mode quickly. All right. Maybe while you're doing that, I'll introduce you. Um, so this is Anita Oberholster. She's the UC Cooperative Extension Specialist in Enology in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis. And her talk today is going to be what we do and don't know about grape smoke exposure. And it looks Thank good. Thank you. Oh, so it looks good? Okay. Um, I switched monitors around. I Sorry, um, I keep doing that. So that is my pretty view of my one um, portrait that somebody did for me, one of my previous students. Okay, otherwise you see my messy office. Okay, so as we're already late, um, and you, you all know I struggle not to catch a steam train, so I'll try my best. So um, I was asked to talk about smoke impact. So I titled the talk, What We Know and Don't Know About Grape Smoke Exposure. Um, I'm going to give it away. We don't know nearly as not enough as much as we should know. Um, but let me give you a little bit of background information. Sometimes understanding the problem make you feel a little bit more in control. So I'd like to start with defining what is a, a wine taint. So wine taint is something that comes from outside. It overpowers the wine. It makes the wine dimensional. If you make a wine one dimensional, you're decreasing the quality. So you're impacting the overall quality of the product. Now, in the case of smoke taint, it's when you have this overpowering, smoky, burnt, campfire, medicinal, earthy characters. Now, that is not an exhaustive list. Sometimes it's very much like bread, barnyard, um, Band-Aid, I've seen bacon, I've seen sweet barbecue. Um, it really is a range. But very distinctive is the lingering retronasal ashtray campfire-like character at the back of your throat. All the other things can come from other sources as well. That's the one thing for me that is very distinctive and indicating smoke exposure of grapes. Now, during a fire, you have a lot of vegetation burning and 15 to 25% of wood consists of lignin. And you can see the structure there on the left. Now, when it burns, you get thermal degradation and it releases a massive amount of things we call volatile phenols. There's a range of different volatile phenols and depending on the vegetation burning, you can get a different range of these compounds. That makes sense, right? Now, the example there is of guacal. They get released in the air and they can disperse on air currents. And it's very difficult to predict how far and how quickly they travel. They can also use debris like ash as a carrier to disperse further. Now, when you have a vineyard and it has being exposed to smoke and you have a lot of volatile phenols in the air, it can very quickly absorb through the berry skin. It's not on the outside, it's the inner layers of the hypodermal cells, so your berry skin. So basically, and the same thing can happen to leaves as well, and it gets glycosylated really, really quickly by transferial um, glucosidase enzymes. Sorry, I'm really tongue-tied today. But basically, this happens within hours. So you can have both free and bound. So you know you have this kind of situation. You have a guacal as an example, and you can have one, two, or three sugars attaching to this volatile phenol. So now you have a range of different free volatile phenols with ex exponentially more potential forms of precursors forming. Now, both the free and the bound are naturally present in grapes. So this makes the issue even more complex. It's not like you're going to analyze for the presence of. They will always be there. You're supposed to determine what's elevated, what's more than is required and will result in a problem. These are the seven main free volatile phenols that most of the commercial labs will screen for. In the beginning, they only looked at glycol and for methylglycol, but we've quickly realized we need to look further to have better predictive power. Now, all of these can have different brown forms and researchers actually, most of us look at even more than the seven. Commercially, those that look at individual bound compounds look at about six. Researchers look at to up about 40 different compounds. And some labs would do total. Basically, they do a hydrolysis process and they release everything that's bound. Um, all this data together can be very useful. 
as we have only a small part of the picture, the more data you have, more puzzle pieces you have to sort of give you a more complete picture to make um, informed decisions. So unfortunately, you can have this kind of situation. You can have a little bit of free and loads of bad. Now, that ratio is not constant, and we do not know what predetermines that ratio. We think perhaps timing of exposure can have an influence in that ratio, but we're not sure. It's something we need to evaluate further. But you can see the concern that if you're only analyzing free, you may be missing and may look fine, and then you have massive amounts of bound that can be released during the winemaking process and during the age period of the wine. So we always refer to this study, it's a really cool study that looked at Merlot vines over three seasons, exposing the vines intentionally to smoke at different key growth stages. And the main point that they found was, if there's a berry, it's susceptible, but it's the most susceptible a week after veraison. However, the Australians have also had a very bad fire season, and some of their vineyards were only exposed to smoke when the berries were rock hard peace signs, and they developed very bad smoke impact. So now we're basically saying, if you have a berry on the vine, assumed it's potentially impacted. The silver lining here, no carryover of smoke-related compounds from the one season to the next, okay? The next season you start fresh, other than if your vineyards, uh, your vines itself um, obviously had some heat damage. Now what happens during winemaking? When you crush your fruit, the volatile phenols are in the skins, they extract very quickly. So if you look, there is a study that was also on Merlot at 25 degrees, is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And they assumed 100% to be seven days of fermentation after pressing. So you can see one, three, and five days, you got 30, 15, 80% of the potential volatile phenols. These compounds are pretty hydrophilic, meaning they like water, they can very easily extract. Now in the pH of wine, that's quite acidic, you get slow hydrolysis of these compounds. Now, there's very limited data, but we looked at this a little bit and found about 25 to 30% of the potential precursors hydrolyzed during winemaking until after malolactic fermentation. Now, the thing is both the free and the bound contribute to the sensory characteristics. Now, you can think, how can the bound contribute? They found that people actually have bacterial enzymes in their saliva that can hydrolyze these bound compounds. So it's being hydrolyzed in your mouth, and that's how we think it contributes to that retronasal um, character of ashtray or campfire by mouth is due to this release of volatile phenols in your mouth. So unfortunately, even the bound, even if they don't release, is part of your problem. So basically also because they extract so quickly, anything that extracts color for red wines will probably extract more volatile phenols as well. People would say, if only we had the threshold values. Now threshold values as the concentration at which a compound in a specific matrix um, becomes apparent, you can notice it. And the detection threshold is when you actually, it has the characteristic you associate with it, say smokiness. The thing is we actually have the threshold values of most of these compounds, but they cause smoke time problems at a 10th of the value of the threshold. It's because they have synergistic impacts. They influence each other and they're impacted by the matrix. You really would need a threshold value of each combination in each kind of wine. So that is what makes it so complex. We, matrix effects are like sugar. We know anything about three grams per liter of sugar can actually inhibit the hydrolysis process in your mouth and reduce the smoke tank that way. For about 14% of ethanol can do the same thing. Are the volatiles. Green character makes like methoxyparazines make the smoke actually stand out where um, estuary fruit aromas can actually hide it. So this is all ways in which the, the matrix can have an impact. And obviously we have a lot of human variability and I will talk about that a little bit later. So what about risk factors? Now this is totally anecdotal. We're trying to work with atmospheric scientists to get better data on this. But at this stage, we believe that if you have fresh smoke, meaning less than 24 hours, if there's a fire further away from you and it takes more than 24 hours for that smoke to get to your vineyard, you have less risk, not no risk, less risk. However, if that smoke gets to you within 24 hours, you have high risk. Now we know if you have fresh smoke, then there is a better correlation between air quality indexes, that's basically the particular matter you can see, 
and the smoke taint risk, because those phenols actually degrade very quickly in the atmosphere. So this is why the older the smoke gets, the less of a correlation there is between air quality and smoke exposure risk for grapes. And that's something to, to keep in mind. Now we know washing grapes doesn't work because the volatile phenols are not sitting on the outside, they're inside. But what about ash? Now we used to say, don't worry about ash, but now we're getting a little bit more concerned about ash. Both myself and, and Tom Collins actually collected ash during the season and analyzed it by GCMS. Now, remember this is at 50 degrees Celsius in an isolate system and the ash was giving off volatile phenols and it gave off volatile phenols for up to a week. But now the thing is, is ash in your vineyard a problem? If you wash it off, it's just gonna lie in the vineyard floor and wet ash actually gives off more volatile phenols than dry ash. So is it worthwhile doing that? I'm not sure. Will that amount of volatile phenols being released even impact the atmosphere around the berries? What I am concerned about is fresh ash being on grapes when it's getting processed because then potentially during grape processing, those volatile phenols on the ash can be released into the juice and become a problem in the wine. And that is something both myself and Tom is looking at. And hopefully before this harvest season, we can give you some um, idea about whether it is or is not a problem. The next thing a lot of people are looking at are berry sprays for grapes. The Australians looked at Cullen. They only um, applied it like a day before smoke exposure. They did it for, I think, something Blanc, Chardonnay and Merlot. Merlot is the only one that they actually saw some decrease in volatile phenols. Now, they said the variability is due to the fact that if you apply a berry spray in a vineyard, you really only get 30 to 40 percent coverage because it's very dependent on your canopy and um, bunch structure and things like that. And that's why it's so variable. Um, British Columbia, Way Zambuk and Matt Nathedon, they did a study where they looked at two fungicides in oil and a biofolum um, that's a phospholipid layer, it's parka. And they used this on Pinot Noir intentional smoking and the oils made it worse. And they said it's because the surface area was increased and you have more volatile phenols that can absorb onto it. The biofilm showed really good results. But however, so the, in this case, they applied it a week before the, they did the intentional smoking. I know they redid the study, applying it at different times before smoke exposure, and then the results were more variable. So we still need to do some work there. This is not a sure thing. There's a lot that we need to investigate. And there's a lot of other berry sprays uh, coming on the market or on the market that people say they think this could actually have um, a good chance of protecting grapes and we need to evaluate these. Then in 2017 is when I actually started looking at smoke exposure impact on grapes. Um, and basically what I did is I got Cabernet Sauvignon from Oakville, Silverado, and Alexander Valley. And I was trying to apply all these different suggestions that the Australians were making to try and mitigate the impact in the winery. I used four different yeast, um, I had two different oak chips that had no oaky or, or no smoky or nutty or kind of toasty aromas that will uplift the fruit. I used a pure elagic tannin and I used different fermentation temperatures. But basically, D80 and BDX both showed good um, properties in hiding the smoke on the nose. Now, I can tell you the Australians didn't think BDX did a very good job. So basically, matrix, once again, have a huge impact here. The really fresh in this instant did the best for me. Lagitana didn't do much with the Australians, really recommends it. And no matter what the fermentation temperature was, I had seven days con skin contact for all of them. At seven days, basically everything was extracted. The enzyme tannin treatment, that's something Laforte wanted me to try, trying to use a mas maceration enzyme to get all the color quickly out, uh, press from the skins at uh, three days, and then finish fermentation. That maceration enzyme is enough to get most of the volatile phenols out, and it really didn't help. So the problem here is also, even though the yeast and some of the oak chip additions did help, in the initially, over time, that smokiness came back, unfortunately. I think it has the potential to help if you have very low impact. My wines were around low to medium impact. Um, it just came back, unfortunately. So mitigation at this stage, we're saying for white wines, if you can handpick, handpick, because obviously anything that damaged the skin, you have more extraction of the volatile phenols. 
exclude mark at this point exclude records we're not sure whether records can absorb volatophenols i did some experiments this year to check that out light pressing keep your press fraction separate yes the force of pressing do actually push more of the volatophenols out even for red wines where you've had plenty of skin contact looking at finding juice instead of the wines if you know your um, grapes were impacted just because the earlier you, you treat the more time you have to use different wine making tools to build it back up like fruity yeast and other things to build body for red grapes low to medium impact i think using fruity yeast light toasted oak all those things can help i don't think it's 100 percent fix Making a rosé for low impact wine is a possibility. It's not always economic viable. Um, the problem is something to remember. You're going to get much less of the volatile phenols because you have much less skin contact. But just remember, you also have a much simpler matrix. So what's there can stand out more easily. So your threshold value basically in that matrix, matrix would be lower than the threshold value in a full body grape. And others that had inventory that weren't impacted by smoke tank just did free run juice, donated skins, and had good fermentations. And obviously, if you have that possibility, that's a really good option. Then we looked in 2018 at different um, immigration options. I looked at only four different enzymes in the food industry and the wine industry. I know the Australian Research Institute looked at something like uh, 15 different enzymes. I saw no impact, they saw variable impact, but nothing worked that well that they're recommending any enzymes for hydrolysis. I waited six weeks and saw nothing at room temperature. Then looking at fining, uh, both activated charcoal and molecular imprinted polymers. The molecular imprinted polymers is where basically they use imprinting, molecular imprinting technology to basically, they use a tempered molecule and they leave a caveat within the polymer that fits that template. So basically, if that template looked like alcohol, then it will very easily trap the alcohol or anything that looks very much like that. It works really well. It's not available in the US and it's not been approved for use. Um, reverse osmosis, standard differential filtration, spinning cone technology. I used four different wines. A very high impact wine that were very close to the Lake County fires, just the press wine and the free run. And then I used a medium impact that was a little bit away from the fires and then a low impact from the previous year. Now, this is looking at the three volatile phenols and you can see all the techniques significantly decreased three volatile phenols. Something to remember is you don't have to remove everything. Remember it's naturally present in grapes. You want to remove enough that you're below threshold and will stay below threshold for the lifetime of that wine. If you look at the total, then it looks a little bit like good. But something to remember, like I said, you don't have to remove everything. What I found was that the lower the impact, the lower smoke impacted the wines are, the better any of these treatments work because um, it's just more easily remove it. There wasn't a standard percentage that was removed. The amount removed was really dependent on the specific wine. So once again, a matrix impact. I give you some idea of what worked best, but it's actually true that in some instances, one technique would work much better than another. And then for another wine, it was swapped around. So basically, you, if you can do bench trials, that's a really good idea, because just because one technique worked really wonderful, well for one wine doesn't mean that that is the best technique to use for the next wine, unfortunately. So this is, we did sensory analysis of these wines. And this is the principal component analysis of only the significant attributes. Now on the left corner, you can see that the two wines with a green circle around it, those were my controls. So good news, the controls were very, very different and orthogonal to, if you look in the right bottom corner, you'll see the characters ash, peatwood smoke. Now ash was that retronasal ashy character and the peatwood smoke was what this panelist um, identified the smokiness on the nose as. So you can see my control was obviously not impacted and, and they rated it well, there was no carryover. You can also see that your wine three and four, those were the wines with the low to medium impacted. They were the wines that were the least ashy and basically had all the smoky characters removed. The ones that were higher impact did not work as well. Now, a limitation here is I had to treat all my wines the same because this is a scientific study. 
And basically what I did is I looked at the highest impact wine and I didn't treat it until everything was done. I treated until the balance of most of the smoke was gone and there was still some body and aroma left, right? That balance. Now, obviously that level of treatment worked really well for the low to medium impacted wines, um, but obviously also the, it stripped them quite a bit. So how to determine grape smoke exposure risk? The best, I, I am a big believer that we need to get by sign data. We need to do what the Australians have done. The, over four seasons, they um, collected 500 grape and wine samples from non-smoke affected grapes for, in several regions, for their 12 uh, main varieties. And basically, when somebody, when they do analysis, they can put it on back on the background of what's baseline. So if you look at those gray bars, that's the range of baseline. And if your wine comes back as that little circle in the middle of baseline, you basically have very low to no risk. Now there's a range because we know that region, season, all those things have an impact on the natural amount in grapes. And we know different grape varieties have naturally different amounts. And we don't know why. We need to go also do genotypic studies to know why they uh, synthesize different amounts. Now, if your data comes back as above baseline, then you're in the high risk category. That makes sense. Now, even if you're baseline and you say you're like a little bit elevated, you're not in the mean, that means you're in that minimal to moderate risk level. But then you know where you are. That is the gray zone when you have baseline data. Our gray zone now way bigger. Then if we have threshold values, but when I say threshold, I mean rejection threshold values. And we have with different concentrations and ranges of these compounds in different varieties, different wine styles. So for Pinot Noir, perhaps a light fruity style versus a more heavier style. What's the rejection threshold by consumers for smoke impact in those wines. Then you have an idea. This is my baseline number. This is my number for my wine compared to baseline. This is the rejection levels for similar matrix. What do I do? You have, that will reduce our gray area so much. So unfortunately, I think recommendations for this season is gonna be pretty much the same as last season. You know, take a berry sample close to harvest because that's what you want. You want your berry sample to reflect what the wine is going to look like. And if you can, if there's a fire and you have time, please go and get baseline. And if we're lucky, I have my fingers crossed and we don't have wildfires impacting wine regions um, this season, see if you can get some baseline numbers for yourself. I don't mean that you have to get it for every block and every variety like you need for, for uh, crop insurance, but perhaps every variety in a region would be great. Perhaps you can work together with your neighbors and work out the program. Um, just so we can build on this data, I do recommend that you don't only get three. You have to get at least three and total or three in the individual bound compounds. We don't really know very well how to interpret the total bound numbers, but with more baseline data, we will know how to interpret them. Um, then smaller fermentations, once again, and you need to make sure it's representative. That's why we say 30 to 40 clusters, one per vine. The more representative it is of a block, the better that data will be. We did release a little video to show you how to do small scale fermentations. We pulled this together in like a couple of days. So now after the fact, I know how we should have done it, but people say it's still helpful. So there's something that you can reference. We do this because the small scale fermentations, wine analysis is easier. It also gave you a better indication because some of the bound has at least released. And then the other advantage is that you can taste it. Um, sensory is a very valuable tool. Even though Australians recommend tasting to narrow that gray region when the data just goes maybe, maybe not. However, 20 to 25% of people cannot taste smoke tank, okay? And some people see that as a good marketing potential. I don't know. What I am saying is that if you do have tasters, you have to screen them. You, make, you have to make sure that you have to have a standard that's smoke impacted and they need to figure out it's smoke impacted. And you should have a standard that's a control that it has no smoke impact because some people see smoke everywhere, right? The other thing, carryover is a huge problem. This is not fast tasting. You rinse your mouth, you want two minutes between tasting. And if you really want to taste that retronasal ashtray, you have to keep the wine in your mouth for a long period of time. I do two tastes, one and a second one, and I keep it long in my mouth to build up 
the potential to hydrolyze the bound and then evaluate it after expectoration. The Australians use a very simple nine point rating, everything on the nose, everything in the mouth. And I think that's a pretty good idea. Simple and clean. So what I did during 2020 harvest, we did a lot of micro and bucket fermentations and tried to relate this to how does this actual compare to commercial winemaking? So we don't have huge tanks, but we have pilot scales about 2000 liters and we have our research curve. See so how well do they actually relate to each other? Can we speed our bucket fermentations? We say those five days, many of my buckets took more than a week to go dry and then another week to actually clarify. What's the impact of breakers? Like I said, we looked at that. We looked at the impact of ash. And then we also looked at varietal impact. We got about 12 varieties from six to seven different regions. Um, and we hope to go back this year when there's no smoke, hopefully get money to go and do the baseline data on all these wines and get an idea of how does varieties differ in their susceptibility to similar smoke exposure and the difference in baseline data. So the take home issues here is Smoke does not equal smoke. Time. I tell um, the general public this all the time. Just because you see some smoke somewhere in the vineyard does not mean that those grapes will be impacted or those wines will be impacted. Um, analysis have limited uh, pre predictive capabilities. It's very important. Look, this is a piece of the puzzle that you need. But just you need to understand that that number isn't everything. Currently, there's no sure mitigation in the vineyard. There's limited mitigation in the winery. There's things you can do to help, help, help hide, but nothing that can fix. Amoration treatments, same thing. There's no 100% fixes. The lack specificity, meaning that you, it impacts overall wine quality. It takes out other positive aroma co compounds and it takes out other uh, positive um, mouthfeel compounds. So the best is really if you can limit treatments as little as possible, and you can blend it away with non-treated wines. <clears throat> so just need to do quick acknowledgements. Obviously, everything I've done up to this point, I can't do anything without financial support. These are all the people that's been supporting my research and some of the people, students in my lab and staff in the winery that has been wonderful in supporting my uh, many, many different smoke impacted um, studies going on at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Well, we only went maybe 10 minutes longer than we expected, but I think we kind of went into lunch and we lost a few people along the way. But before we depart, it doesn't look like there's any uh, questions in the Q&A at the moment, yeah. but before we go, I just wanted to again thank Caroline for helping out with all the logistics with this program and Carl Lund for talking about the various um, topics and speakers uh, to speak today. I wanna to thank all the speakers for their willingness to participate and taking the time to speak. Um, let's see, and, and we wanna thank our extension partners because as Anita mentioned at the end of her talk, we can't do what we do without uh, support from those people that support us. So thank you again to all of our extension partners and thank you all for attending today. And if you don't have any other questions, uh, thank you again to the speakers. I think we're just about just about done. So if I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, then I think we're, okay, well, we're done for today. Bye everyone, have a good day further. Yes, have a great day. Thank you all very much. It was a really great program. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.